good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Bailao. I'm the chair of uh, Planning and Housing Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to now call meeting 31 to order and welcome everyone. Today's meeting is being held by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. The public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. These measures are necessary to comply with public health guidelines and prevent the spread of COVID-19. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. The clerk's staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Planning and Housing Committee page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Clerk's IT, IT staff will be available to members to help with their devices. As part of the agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speaker's list and will call on members when it's their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure they turn on their video and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at phc at toronto.ca to help with motions. If there are any visiting members of council attending the meeting today, I encourage you to turn on your video so that I know that you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions or staff, uh, of staff or to speak. This will also assist the clerk staff to record attendance of the meeting. <clears throat> Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate the item number and the nature of your interest. Okay, seeing none. Uh, next, I need a motion to confirm the meetings of our meeting uh, on January 12th, 2022. Uh, moved by Councillor Perks. All those in favor, that carries. Okay, let's proceed with the agenda review. Item 31.1, development in proximity of rail. Uh, amendment to the official plan final report. Uh, we have speakers on this <coughs> item. Item 31.2, delegation of authority to administer housing and homelessness <coughs> services. We have uh, speakers on this item. Item 31.3, concept to keys, priority development review stream enhancements and adjustments and fourth quarter of 2021 C2K program updates. Uh, we don't have speakers on this item. Anybody wish to hold or can we move this item? A hold. Councillor Wong Tam to hold. Thank item, you. Thank you. Item 31.4, creating transitional and supportive housing opportunities at 1430 Gerard Street East. Authority to sublease exempt property taxes and initiate expropriation proceedings. Um, we also don't have speakers on this item, so we can move the item if there's no questions to staff. I can I'll move that. Up. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher moves the item. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you, Councillor. Item 31.5, new centralized affordable housing access system, consultation findings and concept design. There's no speakers on this item. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, please. Okay, sure. Councillor Fletcher to hold the item. Uh, item 31.6, expanding housing options in neighborhoods, update report. We have a staff presentation and speakers on the item. Item 31.7, our plan Toronto employment area conversion requests preliminary assessment group two. We have speakers on the item. Item 31.8, extension of temporary use zoning bylaws for outdoor patios associated with eating establishments. We don't have, uh, oh. would you like to hold Councillor <coughs> Fletcher or are you moving the item? No, I'll move it noting that every single one of them except one in Councillor Perks Ward is in my ward. <laughs> All of those, thank you. 
I like think we're all looking forward to visit all these patios fairly soon. Yes, they're all, like, they're all in That's <laughs> right. I'll be at Maybe I should move a motion that the committee goes out on a tour of, uh, of the patios. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all those in favor of the item moved by Councillor Fletcher, that carries. Thank you. Item 31.9, um, 0, 119, 125, 160, and 200 Benny Stark Street and 116, 122 Turnberry Avenue, official plan amendment, zoning amendment, and draft plan of subdivision applications. Preliminary report. There's no speakers. I can move the item. All those in favor? That carries. Item 31.10, 2, 4, and 80 Union Street, official plan amendment, zoning amendment, and draft plan of subdivision applications, preliminary report, no speakers, and I can move the item. All those in favor? That carries. Item 31.11, 221 Sterling Road, notice of intention to designate a property under part four, section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. I will, I, there's one speaker, but I would like to inform that we, I will be moving a motion to defer this item to April. Um, and so here's the motion. April, April. Do you want me to stand it down? Okay, let's do the other item, 31.12. 95 St. Joseph Street, Notice of Intention to Designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, there are speakers on this item, so we'll hold it down. Okay, and here's the motion for item 11. Uh, all those in favor of a deferral until April 27. That carries, and uh, to the person that was registered to speak, clerks will be in contact with you to ensure that you will be registered to speak uh, on the item in April. Okay, let's start with item 31.1, development in proximity to rail amendment to the official plan final report. We'll start with uh, speakers, and first we have Alex Taylor. Good morning, Alex. City Chair, that speaker is not present. Okay, we have Robert Levy. Good morning, Robert. To the Chair, I'm now unmuting Robert. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Robert Levy president of the Cataloma Residents Association. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go, go ahead, Robert. Okay, great. I have uh, three points that I would like to make. Um, first of all, um, that I think the city should be taking a holistic planning approach and not a one development uh, at a time. We've been involved in a number of projects and uh, along the DuPont line, the Cataloma area, residence areas just to the north. We also work very closely with the Tarragon Village Community Association and Richard Castle has submitted a brief as well. So we've been involved in a number of projects and I'll use an example of the Bianca condominium. Anyone of you who has not seen the crash wall that was built on the north property line of Bianca right along the rail line I've dubbed this, uh, unfortunately, the Berlin Wall because it is just this huge piece of concrete only on the south side of the rail line with no material on the north side uh, at all in terms of visual appearance or noise reflection. And it's an example of uh, one developer only concerned with uh, selling luxury condominiums and promoting the fact that the noise would be lessened and uh, as part of their sales and marketing. The problem is that there is th the city does not stop at the rail line, and this is only one project that is going to be along the line of many. And so again, I think we're gonna end up with honestly a Berlin Wall from end to end along DuPont. And the problem is that the communities to the north also then face increased reflective noise. So I think it's really important 
that the city be armed with uh, uh, a plan and tools to anticipate uh, multiple developments. I also think we should be looking at examples, uh, not just in Canada, but any of you who've been to New York and have seen the transformation of the High Line and realize what that has done for the city, I really think it's time to take a look at uh, whether this rail line that ex existed in the late 1800s, beginning of 1900s, when there was no development to the north, that it's time to relocate um, or tunnel. That takes me to the second point of night noise. Night noise is not the same as day noise. As someone who has been very involved in working with NAV Canada and the governments of uh, Canada around the relocating of the flight path. As many of you may know, the flight path that um, basically attracts all the southern, U all the U.S. traffic from, uh, from the U.S. that comes to uh, Toronto actually goes up over High Park, traverses across um, many, many residential neighborhoods before the planes <laughs> go north to land westbound because of the, um, <clears throat> the basic uh, weather conditions. We were successful in working with NAV Canada to help relocate the flights after 11 p.m. Because every flight that goes at night, just like every train that goes at night and wakes people up, disturbs sleep and has major health consequences. And right now the standards look at things like average noise over an hour. And ultimately for anyone who is living uh, near the, the rail line, when you are woken up by a plane or you are woken up by a train, that noise has much more impact than when the, the train is passing during the day. So I do believe, again, we should be looking at relocating those trains, removing traffic at nighttime, or again, <clears throat> basically creating a tunnel in residential areas. The third point and my last point that I would like to make um, deals with noise reflection. We know from talking to noise uh, consultant engineers, in fact, uh, consultant engineers who are working for the city, they're on your peer review roster right now, and we were consulting with um, some of them on a specific project. There are ways to ensure that reflective noise, so when you look at a crash wall that is built, if you look at the Bianca one, it is a hard surface of pure concrete that is just running from end to end on that property. Any noise engineer or sound engineer will tell you a hard surface reflects noise um, more than a surface that has texture or has a complex shape. So there are things that can be done that would reduce reflective noise to residential communities on either side of any development when there are things like a crash wall. All you have to do is take a look at driving along 401 and you see the sound barrier. You can see that Robert, they all I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Your five minutes are up. Yes, no problem. So I think it's important that the city be armed with best practices and make sure that they're asking developers to apply those materials and also look at both sides of the rail line for a crash wall, not just one side, and it needs to be done holistically. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Robert. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you so much. Um, that completes uh, the list of speakers on this item. Are there any questions of staff? I, yeah. ha I have a question of staff, please. Councillor Fletcher. Um, what are the requirements on a heavy rail line for walls, please? Uh, through the speaker, uh, I want to ask uh, Brooke Marshall to uh, help you with your question. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Brooke. Through you, Madam Chair, through you, Madam Chair um, the requirements are to meet uh, risk mitigation uh, levels of construction. At this time, the rail safety studies are specifically um, aimed at addressing issues related to derailments and the potential harms that can come from derailments. Um, we do also look to have noise and vibration studies undertaken at the same time that the rail safety technical study is being undertaken, and we will add specific instructions into the terms of reference to ensure that this is done. This uh, just development by development, though, as the deputant has mentioned, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, and do you have any mechanism to 
require crash walls on heavy rail that aren't related to development? Uh, at this time, that is not what's being proposed. Yes, but do we have any ability to do that? And should who would who has the jurisdiction over that? The federal government is that their their track? Through you, Madam Chair, um, yes, it would need to come either from the provincial government or through the federal uh, regulations on rail lines. But who who would that be? From Go? From Metrolinx? From who at the feds or who at the province would do that? Well, many of these, uh, through the speaker, uh, Councillor, many of these lines that traverse the city may be uh, lines uh, run by Canadian National or Canadian Pacific, the CP or CN rail lines. There are also lines where um, Metrolinx runs GO services, as you know. So it, it, it would involve all of those all of those agencies and companies, and within uh, all within their jurisdiction. So. The, the focus of this, as you as you know, is on development. No, I understand. Uh, yes, but otherwise, you're you're dealing with a company-led or Metrolinx-led initiative to uh, mitigate uh, mitigate rail impacts on communities that uh, these lines traverse. But uh, yes, I understand. This is the development side, but the deputants raised, why can't it just happen anyway? So really, it's right. the federal federal regulations. Who regulates heavy rail? Is it the federal government or the provincial government? You, Madam Chair, it's the federal government that regulates heavy rail for the most part, and the province does participate, um, but the majority of the regulation sits with the federal government. And that what what uh, powers, and who, who is it that regulates that at the federal level? Agency or? Um, the Rail Safety Act is, through you, Madam Chair, the Rail Safety Act is involved as well as uh, regulations to the Ministry of Transportation. I just want to talk, is that Federal Ministry of Transportation? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So the Rail Safety Act, and that's a federal federal act, and it's under which minister? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I believe it is also through the, the Transportation Minister at the federal level. And it's specifically known as the Rail Safety Authority, the Minister of Transport. And what, uh, give me some idea of what, what they could do if they wanted to do. They could say, crash walls everywhere, heavy rail, we're taking more precautions, or they could just leave it as is. It's their choice, is that right, to regulate the, uh, the corridor? Sure, yes. Madam Chair, they could do that, but they are unlikely to do that. Well, I'm not asking if they're unlikely. I'm asking who has the authority, and they do have that authority. They have the authority to require that, but they have the authority to require that on all of the, uh, and I know this is not exactly related to development, but there's so many development nodes that are being planned for the Ontario line and other transits that are being built. Uh, do they have the authority to uh, require that of a provincial agency? For you, Madam Chair, yes, they could be working with the province to expand the requirements that come from the provincial government onto the municipal responsibilities, but at this time that has not happened. And, and I'll just add, and Derek's joined us, but uh, there is a federal, a lot of this is taken up through the FCM, a work that's done across the country, and the, the work that um, as, as regulations get revisited and, and initiatives get undertaken, that conversation takes place between the federal authorities and uh, and municipalities uh, across the country. I don't know if Derek, Thank you want to supplement. But I just that. since since Mr. Teugel's here, Madam Chair, I'm just going to ask for another minute because now we have our head of transit expansion. I'm asking what authority the rail the Minister of Transportation has to require crash walls and noise reg, uh, mitigation walls along rail corridors that. They are that they have the ultimate authority over. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, to the Councillor, um, the Federal Rail Authority typically works with the rail operator. Uh, so, as Greg mentioned, um, whether it's CP, CN, or Metrolinx, in case of uh, the rails within the City of Toronto, they work with them to uh, define the various regulations that are required. Uh, to to ensure that there's safe um, access of the of the trains through uh, the city. Through the city so they have the uh, they have to sign off on that, do they? The 
there is, uh, uh, again, through you, Madam Chair, to, to the Council, there's an independent safety authority that's been established um, that uh, is now looking at uh, independently the requirements of um, the various uh, rails, uh, rail uh, and, and safety requirements uh, for the rails in the, um, in the city throughout, throughout the country. Sorry. Yes. Um, this rail authority works with both the federal government as well as the rail operator to ensure that the appropriate safety measures right. are in place. But, but the transportation minister under the Rail Safety Authority Act has the authority to require certain things, despite the fact correct. there's an independent safety authority. He, that person, he or she, has that, that is their job. That is correct, Councillor. So they, they ultimately have the authority as the federally regulated, um, because these are federally regulated uh, rail corridors, they have the ultimate authority, although they work very closely with the operators. No, I understand that. Just as we work closely with many operators, but at the end of the day, the city has the authority to say yes, no, you must do this, you don't have to do right. this. That we have the authority. The federal yes, you are correct. Minister of Transportation under the Rail Safety Authority Act has the authority to require certain things on rail corridors in this country. Last question. If I said that. Thank you. You are correct, Councillor. Thank you so much. Great. Any other councillors with questions of staff? Seeing none, uh, speakers on the item? I will. Go ahead, Councillor Fletcher. I, uh, I feel that, uh, and while I, I hope the deputant, I'm glad we had a deputant on this, and I hope the deputant heard the answers, that right now, because the federal authorities are not intervening on their regulated rail line, it really is left up to development by development. But I certainly agree with the deputant that this is an area that we have to really press on the federal government because there are so there's so much development that is going to be finding itself on the rail line to be able to have a common uh, barrier that isn't as ugly as we've heard about from the deputant I think is really important and that the feds have that ability to say to anybody that's doing rail expansion such as the Ontario line or any of the expanded corridors Lakeshore East the six tracks instead of two, um, that here's the requirements in order to proceed. And that's the first time I've ever heard that. Lifting this up from development by development to something that's required in the corridors through a city of three million people. And I'll just note, it'll be interesting when we get to council, but Councillor Mantis and his board, he's got uh, the expansion of one of the Metrolinx lines and I've seen the crash wall that was determined to be put up. It's in somebody's backyard. It's about four feet high. It just doesn't do the job. So I really think that the federal government has to step in, that minister has to step in to make sure that while we're expanding the, all of the rail, while we're expanding transit through rail, while we're developing massively along every rail corridor, that we have the safest conditions, that we have the most urban conditions, and I don't think we're there yet. So uh, thank you very much for, I'd say, your deputation and staff that we really should be requiring more of these rail corridors, step by step, design by design. I know that, I know that there is a uh, design guideline that our fantastic planning staff and urban design team have been putting together, which would mean we would not have just ugly concrete walls, but things that are far more decorative that could fit in, that would have a bit of the culture of the community there. And I want to thank you, Mr. Wintern, for that. I had, can't happen fast enough for folks like our deputant and to set those standards somewhere with the federal government rail it for the rail corridor so thanks very much and with that i can move the i can move the uh, item unless anybody else wants to speak thank you councillor fletcher any other speakers on the item 
Seeing none, Councillor Fletcher moves the item. All those in favor? And that carries. Okay. 31.2, Delegation of Authorities to Administer Housing and Homelessness Services. We have one speaker on the item, uh, Kira Heineken. Kira? To the chair, one moment, please. To the chair, I am now I'm muting their line. Good morning, Kira. Uh, good morning. Thank you for unmuting me. I couldn't obviously couldn't figure it out. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to be here this morning. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today to share our strong support for the recommendations before you in item PH31.2. My name is Kira Heineck. I'm the Executive Director of the Toronto Alliance Head Homelessness. The changes affected by the recommendations in today's report are very welcome. The TAH and our partners have long envisioned and advocated for a more streamlined governance approach that takes the whole continuum of housing and homelessness services into account. Uh, da, 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 da. In planning, funding, operations, data collection, performance measurement, and in course correction. In June of 2018, we deputed to the Special Committee on Governance with the deputation signed by many on the need and rationale for a single standing committee on housing. This was when the then Affordable Housing Committee was only a special committee, and there was great excitement that we would all, elected officials, city staff, community voices, and people of lived experience, work on housing solutions to prevent and end homelessness in one place. Of course, events transpired later that year to radically alter the makeup of council overall and the need, uh, it became apparent that the need to re redesign the council committee structure as a whole. So we came back in February 2019, three years ago, to make the case for one single and coordinated place for discussions and decision making regarding the city's actions along the whole continuum of homelessness and housing. So these changes today uh, are going to make a significant difference in getting us to that place. At the time, it proved difficult to strike one committee as the authorities and the duties, funding sources, et cetera, through which housing and homelessness services are delivered were split among three different city divisions. And while the TAH has worked well with both the resulting committees since then, and both applaud and are encouraged by the progress made in moving to a more housing-focused response to homelessness, this next step of consolidating the authority for housing and related housing services with the Housing Secretariat and streamlining homelessness services with FSHA addresses the challenges of these splits and will allow even more success in both areas. We were a part of, or are a part of the Housing TO Advisory Council and are encouraged and confident that these changes will allow the Housing TO vision and action plan to be better executed, delivering better outcomes for people at risk of experiencing homelessness. And one of the key recent commitments of the city and com of this committee and city council embedded now in Housing TO is the creation of 18,000 supportive housing units. As you are well aware, this will make a significant impact in ending homelessness for many people. And these changes to the delegated authorities will ensure greater coordination across city efforts and working with the community, including through our Toronto Supportive Housing Growth Plan. The recommendations in this report also better support the strategic shift of direction approved by Council in December 2020 to maintain a robust housing-focused emergency shelter system while pivoting to more sustainable long-term solutions to homelessness through the provision of permanent, affordable, and supportive housing. So in closing, I must take this opportunity to also recognize the dedication and talent of city staff in both the Housing Secretariat and SSHA in grappling with addressing homelessness. We believe that these changes, including the important addition of the Tower Renewal Program, will better support their ability to focus their efforts even more effectively in creating a Toronto where homelessness is truly rare, brief, and non-recurring. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kira. Any questions to the speaker? No. Thank you, Kira, for joining us today. That is the only speaker we had on this item. Any questions of staff? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to know um, if the staff can provide us some insights on whether this shift to uh, the Housing Secretariat uh, for delegated authority for uh, uh, sort of for, for purview over the file, will this give the city um, more ability to access provincial and federal dollars, which is a big missing portion of that pie chart that we keep seeing? Um, through the chair, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, we think this is a, a good move to um, further kind of clarify and consolidate roles, which I think will help in the communication of our goals and ambitions with both the federal and the provincial governments. Yeah, so we feel, although this doesn't, is not a step on their part to actually provide additional resources, we feel that this is really helpful for us to be clearer about what we want to achieve and, and how we want to achieve that and give them a clearer point of access into the city for housing initiatives and homelessness initiatives. Thank you. And is it your opinion that, this, that the federal or provincial government has been confused by the city's process in the past? Is there, a, is, is there a reason why they haven't necessarily stepped up, especially with the provincial government? Are we reorganizing this largely so that they have a better understanding of how our order of government and how the priorities are set out here? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the major constraint as to why we haven't received the resources we've been requesting. Uh, this um, attempt to clarify was really based on our desire to um, more effectively deliver our goals that we set out in Housing TO and also on the homelessness side, the specific goals that uh, my colleague uh, Gord Turner has and his team. Um, but I think this, anything we do to clarify and be more specific about our roles and our goals um, is helpful to the other levels of government, but I don't know that that is uh, the primary kind of constraint around their their investment in housing as a as a um, as an outcome we want to see for residents. Okay, thank you. Um, and Abigail, can you explain to us, um, you know, what type of authority you have uh, under this uh, under the recommendations in the report? Uh, is it that your you will get delegated authority over council, or will key decisions uh, regarding key acquisitions, dispositions, um, you know, so overall strategies? Does that still go back go back to council? I'm just curious. Um, thank you, Councillor, and through the chair. Um, what we are changing really is where in the organisation uh, those authorities lie. So currently, um, the authorities for um, Kind of receiving and spending money received by the federal provincial governments, the um, authorities as they relate to the Housing Services Act all lie with the general manager of SSHA. And what we're doing is um, breaking those apart and clarifying, as consolidating the ones on housing with myself and the ones on homelessness re reside or continue to reside with Gord Tanner. So there's no change here that changes either of our um, responsibilities to council. It's really okay. just between ourselves, that's, and also with the changes with tower renewal as well. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. No further questions, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Nunziata. Question on the last comment you made. So, um, what is the change in the tower renewal? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Through the chair, we are consolidating, we're moving Tower Renewal, the team, currently reside in SDFA. We're proposing to move them over to the Housing Secretary, and all this report is doing is making sure um, that those, that with them come the authorities that I need to support the team and get the work done. So, that would, uh, would that expedite the process as well, um, transferring it over? So, uh, through the chair, Chair, all of these um, changes that we're making are really about bolstering our ability to respond quickly. As you know, okay. the housing TO plan was um, is ambitious, it's comprehensive, and we felt that really to be successful, we need a, needed a different organization of staffing and resources within, within um, the city, and we carried out a comprehensive review. And these are the key changes that they suggested to us that would make the most difference. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Just a, a question. Um, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. So what you're saying is we're just aligning the functions to the departments. And now that we have a, I'd say a mature housing division, those uh, efforts which were nested in other places, which didn't deal directly with housing are now moving under that authority or jurisdiction. Would I be right to say it like that? Uh, yes, through the chair, yes, Councillor Fletcher, that, that's actually very well put. Okay, so we're not changing, nothing's changing in, out there, it's just internally the alignment. So SDFA, they were administering that, but they don't really deal with the bigger housing picture. So that makes sense to move that function for tower renewal into the housing, into the new oh. housing division. Through the chair, we think it does make sense. I would just clarify that we are, we will be communicating this to our partners ex externally to the city. It's important that the partners we work at, uh, work with understand who to contact uh, and to work with at the city. So we'll be doing that uh, once once we have all the approvals that we need to make those changes. Um, and do you find uh, that, that those partners, they like to be able to go to one place, not have to go to many different city divisions. That actually drives people crazy when they have to do that. Uh, through the chair, I think that's definitely help, helpful to streamline access. Um, but none of this does take away from the need for us to continue to collaborate between divisions at the city 100%, on, correct. on many complex issues. So this is not a, you know, an alternative continuing that dialogue or collaboration. This is just an attempt to further clarify some of the key roles around housing. And setting a lead up for other city divisions. That's correct. Thank you. Through the chair, yes. I think we lost everybody. Um, Madam Chair, it's Council Wong Tan. I was wondering if, um, if I could ask one final quick question. I had about two minutes left on my board and I forgot. I, I, the, the, the question that just came from um, Councillor Nunziata just jogged, uh, jogged something for me. Is go that ahead. possible? Um, okay, go thanks. ahead, Councillor. It seems I, I can't see most of the committee members. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. We can hear you. Okay, Pam. go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, okay thank go you. ahead, Councillor Walter. Um, okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Abigail, sorry about this. Uh, a, a question. The Downtown East Action Plan currently sits in the Tower Renewal Program. It's not a great fit, I don't think so, but it's where it's been. So does that mean you're inheriting the Downtown East Action Plan along with the, the, trial, the Tower Renewal Program? Um, through the chair, I'll maybe comment. I don't know if uh, uh, the DCM or Denise also want to jump in, but no, we're separating out the tower renewal specific work on towers from the downtown east action plan. But I don't know, Paul, if you wanted to jump in there. Uh, through the chair, just to, to say yes, we, we're, that piece of work is not shifting over and we're looking at how to a strength and change uh, that that work that uh, that I've been involved with and at Aronke and lots of other folks. So, uh, no, not a wholesale change in how that uh, that program is going to be supported by our staff. Okay, um, so right now it's with you, Paul, until it finds a new home. Uh, so through the chair, it sits in SDFA, and uh, but uh, as uh, Juliana had in the past, uh, I play a role with that group and, and actually chair the executive meeting that occurs on a regular basis. So the short answer is it will be in both places, yes. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other councillors with questions? Seeing none, uh, speakers on the item? No speakers? Okay. I will move the, uh, the recommendations and I will just say a few words. Um, I think I shared with um, many counselors and uh, I know that uh, many uh, nonprofits and many of our partners also saw uh, a chart that we did at the Affordable Housing Committee that was a special committee a few years ago on mapping everywhere that was housed, that had housing issues. And let me tell you, it was uh, quite telling uh, of how complex it was. And we all understand that housing is a complex issue, but we, 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 we soon realized, uh, and by hearing so many of our partners saying that we needed to do a better job 
uh, in streamlining and having decision making and looking at the housing continuum. And, uh, and I think that's, that's why we're here today. I think as uh, uh, Kira very well said in her deputation, because many of our partners, partners have been involved in developing this, um, there was a very strong attempt to elevate housing as a standing committee, which uh, we've all uh, you know, supported that. But it was also important to have a, a better and, and more coordinated approach to delivering housing in the housing continuing from supportive housing, from housing benefits, from affordable housing, from uh, you know the delivery of the housing plan, the accountability to deliver the housing plan. And we know that you know the housing secretary will still have to collaborate and to work very closely with all kinds of departments, but there is now um, a department that will manage those relationships, that will ensure the delivery of, uh, of the housing plan and, and work with the sector as well. So I think this is a great move. Uh, very excited to see it finally uh, happening and, and I hope that, uh, that we'll, uh, we'll make it easier for our partners, for our staff, for all of us uh, that, uh, that work on housing uh, to see this in, in one location. So i um, very happy to move the recommendations and hope that we can all support it. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you so much. Um, and next we have item three, concept to keys, priority development review stream enhancements and adjustments and fourth quarter of 2021 C2K program updates. Uh, we don't have speakers on the item. Uh, questions to staff. Uh, Councilor Wong Tam, you've held the item. Would you like to start? Uh, uh, yes, speaker, thank you. Uh, uh, speaker, just one, uh, one, speaker, uh, one question. Chair, yes, yes. So I'm going to recognize you right away. I didn't have you on my screen, but I just got notified that you are here to actually ask questions on this item. Go oh, ahead, okay. Councilor Carroll. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just don't know if, if you. Like non-members always going first in this this committee. That's why I interrupted Councillor Wong-Tan. Go, go ahead, Councillor Carroll. I'll, I'll proceed. Yep, go uh, ahead, yeah, Councillor Carroll. I'm leaving my video off. Uh, I'm leaving my video off because uh, uh, the service isn't the best this morning, as you've already mentioned. Um, I just wanted to ask: Is in this report that one of the things that is talked about um, is is the interaction with, with the community, engagement with the community is being built into the process and expedited. And the, but there are a lot of really brand new concepts here, particularly in the suburban neighborhood, uh, um, looking at, uh, you know, looking at some of the further on in this agenda, we're looking at expanding housing options in neighborhood zones and such. And I'm wondering if in the expediting of the, uh, in, in the expediting the process and trying to get to decisions sooner, if we're still leaving room and still leaving the staffing for those times when we need to have more than the statutory uh, consultation need, those, uh, those situations where, where we might need a working group process, which is, you know, uh, it's an add-on that we have in the city of Toronto that's it's not perfect and we're, we're struggling through it, but is there still going to be room for that? And when C2K has finished its, uh, its uh, um, uh, uh, all of its goals. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the question and uh, through the chair. Um, the, uh, the report you have in front of you is, is, is really meant to accelerate good developments. It certainly does not circumnavigate uh, or avoid any current city um, practices or policies. Uh, so it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't eliminate any consultations that would need to occur. Okay, okay, thank you. That was my only question, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Any members of the committee with questions? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you. Um, and Chris, uh, we had spoken about this issue yesterday, and I wanted to sort of get it out here uh, for, uh, for the committee. Um, there are 16, the, the staff report recommends the hiring of 16 new individuals to manage the concept of the um, uh, program. And right now there are 20 applications uh, for development uh, in the pipeline that have uh, some form of inclusion in affordable housing. Uh, is that correct? Are those the correct numbers? Uh, through the chair, uh, I think that's largely correct. That's right. 
Okay. And so will and, and sixteen for twenty applications. So is that is that number expected to grow? The number of staff persons, um, or perhaps do uh, you know the number of new applications that might be coming down the pipeline? Uh, through the chair, so the report lists out, and I think attachment one talks about. So there's a number of applications that have come um, that uh, are you know coming from 2021 into 2022, and then there's a number of applications that are part of 2022. So that number is both of those combined. That's what the 16 staff is is meant to address. Okay, thank you. And on average, uh, how many files will each staff person be handling? Um, recognizing that some of them will be working in teams, but I'm just curious to know what is what is the anticipated workload of a, of a single staff person here? To the chair, um, the workload would uh, differ depending on you know the specialty that's listed, so it wouldn't necessarily be the same for everybody. Um, you see, there's there's a group of five core divisions that we work with, um, so it might be a little bit different for you know, a planner versus an engineer. What we found on this particular review stream. Uh, is that um, the engineering, urban design, and transportation elements are particularly heavy, uh, and that's why if you if you look at this to the report, um, you can see that we're actually trying to double the capacity in those areas, which is a you know directly trying to address what we experienced during the pilot. Okay, thank you. And is the intention to hire people from outside of the corporation, or do you think still some of these individuals will move from within the corporation? Uh, thanks for the question. Through the chair, um, I would imagine it would be a combination of both, um, but certainly we would, um, uh, I would imagine we would hope to um, receive some external uh, assistance. Okay, thank you. Um, in Toronto East York Community Council, um, oftentimes uh, our, our planners, and I'm sure this is the case across the entire community planning portfolio, um, is that we often have, at times have community planners sitting with 20, 30, potentially 40 applications uh, for rezoning or OPA amendments. Um, are any of those, will the concepts to keys program alleviate the overworked community planners that we have right now? Uh, is it gonna make their lives easier? How will this be a benefit overall to community uh, city planning? <coughs> Through the chair, when we um, when we did this uh, pilot in 2021, what we did is we borrowed staff from each of the divisions to accelerate priority development reviews, uh, or applications, excuse me. And so the challenge with that is when we borrowed staff without providing a backfill, uh, is that it um, it put perhaps more strain on those base divisions. By coming here today uh, and seeking new staff, what we're doing is uh, allowing everybody the backfill to increase that capacity while maintaining a philo that will grow throughout 2022. So yes, I think this will um, work to help alleviate some of those, but not all, uh, because this is still very much related to priority developments. Okay, thank you. And if, if, you're, if you're planning to perhaps recruit staff from the existing city uh, community planning division, then how does that help us with the backlog and the overworked community planners that we have now? Um, and I'll have one more question after you answer. Certainly, so I'll try to be quick. Um, I think that just leaving, you know, I think a lot of staff feel very, um, they would like to provide assistance on uh, accelerating affordable housing. And so providing an opportunity for staff and externals to be part of C2K to do that, I think is important. When we, um, when we finished the pilot program in 2021 and asked staff how they felt about it, a lot of them mentioned specifically that they felt it was important to accelerate affordable housing. And so, I, you know, if the direction from council is to look external, that's something that, you know, we could look at. But um, certainly, we wouldn't want to avoid the opportunity for internal staff to apply to this. Okay, then my final question is, does the province's new report on expediting housing development affect uh, CTK's uh, planning or, or, or program? program? Because the province has built everything faster, get it through the pipeline faster, and we're going to take the power of community planning in some ways out of community. They're going to sort of upload it back to the province. How does that change your program, or will it? Yeah, through, the, through the chair, um, I can. I, I know there's 55 recommendations in that report. I know some of them uh, align with, with what we're trying to do, and some of them perhaps don't. Um, from, from my perspective, I think the ones where there's obvious collaboration, um, you know, we'll look to see if we can, you know, we can use. 
Um, but perhaps, um, Greg, I see you there. Maybe that's something that you can pick up. I, I can't really answer that from a city planning perspective. Yeah, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the chair, Councillor Longtime, uh, there are recommendations in the, in the um, Housing Affordability Task Force report which relate to process, um, some of which may, uh, may be problematic in a Toronto context, and, and some actually, though, uh, do align with work that we've already got underway uh, through C2K. Uh, such things as development facilitators uh, and, pro and project managers and other enhancements that we can bring to the, uh, you know, the what I call the mechanics of the planning process. Uh, so, in so far as that report identifies some of those ideas, I'd say we're we're already on it. Um, there are, as I as as I said, though, there are aspects of it that are, uh, I think, a little more challenging in a Toronto context. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other councillors with questions of staff? Councillor Bradford. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I could be quick. Just wondering if folks could um, walk us through some of the criteria for selecting applications for the priority uh, development review stream. Thanks so much for the uh, question, Councillor. Um, Abigail or, or Dennis, I'm wondering if maybe that's something um, I'll be over to you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, and through the chair, Councillor Bradford. So some of the key criteria include um, the number of affordable housing units included, so larger projects with more affordable units are prioritised, those with longer terms of affordability, um, those which are led by Indigenous or by partners, uh, those that are on uh, public land or have secured um, provincial, federal or city investments. Um, so those are some of the key criteria that we use to prioritize. Is there anything in terms of additional criteria that you think might be missing today? Um, through the chair, this is something we can we continue to try to get feedback from our partners, um, you know, from councillors uh, on and something that we're willing to, you know, that we're kind of actively reviewing. So if you have any feedback for us, we'd be um, happy to take that. But this is something we're constantly refining, seeing how it affects um, the list of priority projects that we're able to um, we're able to able to be served by C2K, um, and obviously there's a much longer list of affordable housing projects than just the ones which are supported right. by concept keys. If there was uh, additional criteria or metrics that could be used in that evaluation, would that decision come here to planning and housing, or is that something that staff have delegated authority to include? Um, through the chair, we, we have included or we've shared that criteria, I think, previously with the with the committee here in one of the annual reports. We're happy to take, you know, feedback on them. Right now, this is something the Housing Secretariat needs in consultation with uh, C2K. But if, if councillors have feedback they'd like to give us or additional criteria or metrics that they think would be helpful, then please share that with us. Okay. Um, the report talks about um, some of the challenges that folks delivering affordable housing, um, you know, particularly on the experience side, the repertoire of existing projects that they can point to and just familiarity of working through this new process. Um, what does it, that additional staff support look like from concept to keys? How are we helping prioritize and shepherd those applications through uh, recognizing the different nature of the partners that are bringing these projects forward? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Through the chair, um, so Councilor, if I understand, uh, I think what you're asking is kind of what is the, the concept, the key specific staffing element, and how does that kind of... Basically, we have folks, proponents, who are trying to build affordable housing in the city. They're trying to work through the program. It's very difficult to do. They may not have a, a long history of development experience, but they want to be in this space. What are we doing to help them? What is that? What's your typical engagement where they're like, yeah, we're trying to move this forward don't necessarily know how to do it, we're hitting these roadblocks, how do you navigate that? You're hiring up, you know, in building additional capacity, but you must surely hear the same sorts of questions and roadblocks over and over. Certainly, so I can I can address that. So through the, uh, through the chair, one of the key things that we're doing is we have kind of, you know, weekly touch points with applicants when needed. We walk them through city processes, right? Many of these applicants have not actually done a development in the city of Toronto before. 
And so, you know, we understand that and we have staff capacity to work them through what's needed and the requirements. That does obviously, you know, add to the, the workload on this and which is, you know, mentioned in the report. But it's those types of elements and that coordination with all with the applicants as well as the commenting partners that allows us to accelerate um, and what we've achieved to date with those accelerated timelines. Okay. Uh Lastly, just on the timeline, so it's good to see that we're we're making some gains when it comes to reducing the review timelines for circulation. Do we know if that's actually leading to quicker overall project approval on these uh, priority development applications? Are we measuring that versus a standard development application? I know it's kind of apples and oranges, and you're not every project's different number of units and context, but. Do we have a sense of um, are the efforts that we're taking actually translating into projects being approved and working through the system faster? Yeah, through or the shared, faster I think in the context of these projects. I want to know is this faster than a standard standard application? If you can make that comparison. Yeah, uh, through the chair, I think it's a it's a very reasonable question, and I, I would say yes. One of the things that we've had is, or to keep in mind, is we've only had the pilot for one year, um, and we've only we've only had the opportunity to kind of review how quickly we've been able to move for that amount of time, and not all those applications have finished. I do think that with you know the average timelines increasing by you know pr pretty significant amount, that, that expectation uh, that the approvals will come faster um, will be met. Um, in addition to that, we have a number of things that we're doing in 2022 from a KPI perspective, from a performance management perspective. That's something that we'll certainly continue to track. But I think it's important just to recognize, you know, at this point, we're still standing this up. We just finished our pilot, so we still need to learn a little bit, but it's definitely something we're going to track, and I expect that we'll be able to get to approvals faster. Chris, Abby, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Okay. Any other uh, Councillor Nunziata? Thank you. So Abby, I, just a question, if you can explain the process. Um, so if a, if a development application is submitted into the city and they're proposing affordable housing, um, majority affordable housing, sometimes even 100% affordable housing, are those applications from planning uh, sent to you for review? Um, through the chair, um, thank you, Councillor Nanziata. So, um, Affordable housing projects come to our attention through multiple uh, doors or windows, if you like. Sometimes they come direct to the Housing Secretariat looking for assistance with investments. Sometimes they come direct to um, C2K or through to our planning teams. Um, so it really depends. We try to ensure that there's a, um, a high degree of coordination internally so that we're all aware of, of those projects. Most affordable housing projects, in fact, almost all of them, I'm looking at the list now, need some kind of additional support investment or incentives from the City of Toronto, and so therefore they will be um, known to us in the Housing Secretariat, and, and therefore to councillors as well. But what if they don't need additional support? Um, they're proposing to build affordable housing. Uh, through the chair, um, if, if they don't need additional support, which I would say is extremely unusual, um, then they would be dealt with um, through planning, through CTK as a regular development application. I don't know, Greg, if you wanted to make any comments there. But I think it goes back to the criteria and the complexity of the applications, Councillor. Some, some, uh, I think we, you know, certainly with open door applications, for example, we do pre-screening. So we know with open door applications that there aren't any major policy issues, that there are no showstopper issues that they're working through the same plan. Uh, we, you know, they're, they're, they're set up for success, so to speak, whereas there are some applications across the city that are much more problematic and complex and they get into infrastructure issues, there may be policy issues involved, uh, and, and they may involve a rezoning. So they, they uh, you know, to expedite those without having solved all of those policy issues and infrastructure issues doesn't quite mesh. So we try to vector off the, the, uh, the affordable projects that we know um, can be successful, they need help because maybe they're a one-time applicant, but that, that's kind of the, the conversation that takes place with uh, C2K and, and Abby's team. So those applications that don't then, so they go, uh, there are a lot of delays on those applications then, so we can delay those applications for months and years, right? 
Well, I don't think I would cost, I would, I would characterize that as a delay. If there's a, if, for example, there's a fundamental disagreement about an application, then, then there's a disagreement. We, you know, we, we work through applications that have um, uh, issues to resolve. We work through those in a rezoning process as we normally would. And if we're able to resolve the issues, we, we recommend approval to City Council. Um, just on, on the list in the report um, on priority applications, uh, average time for staff review and comments is five is five weeks. So is that five weeks before it's on the uh, community council agenda for the preliminary report? Uh, through the chair, uh, Dennis, I'm wondering if you can uh, take that question. Maybe. Sure. Um, through the chair. Uh, the five weeks refers to, um, so in general, uh, so whether it's rezoning or site plan application, the five weeks refers to the amount of time um, that it takes to circulate the application materials to the various staff groups, um, for those groups to review them, uh, provide their comments, uh, consolidate those comments, and then return them to the applicant for, for them to revise and improve their application. So it specifically focuses on, on that activity and, and we know that that's one of the activities where um, sort of the coordination and focus of a team can help to uh, reduce the amount of time required um, um, you know um, that an applicant is, is with the city um, as part of the review process so, so that's what the five weeks focuses on uh, it's not specifically related to preliminary reports thank you Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, yes. So the many of these have NOACs that are. How long did it take you to do the NOAC in this expedited process? How long is the uh, under review process? How long is the NOAC process in the C2K expedited world? Through the chair, again, I'll ask you, Dennis, to comment on the specifics. Sure. Uh, so through the speaker, and I think this uh, builds on um, Council Bradford's question, which is the actual approval timelines themselves. Um, we're going to be getting more information on that and, and a closer to attention to that in 2022 as some of these close out and, and move through that approval space. Um, some of the um, you know, so far, some of the earlier ones um, have been, you know, in the neighborhood of six months, but certainly there are ones that are longer than six months. That Sorry, six uh, months for which one? Under sorry, review um, or NOAC? So for, uh, uh, so for, as an example, Under Women Healing Lodge, which came to this, uh, this uh, committee uh, in 2021, um, had a, or came to council, uh, had about a six month period to know it. Um, others are making their way through it. And I think when we have more that have reached that milestone, I think we'll come back and um, advise A, how long it took to get there, um, but also some of the learnings um, with respect to um, what were the elements that made up the time to approval so that we can learn and improve from those. Will you be talking to, uh Streetcar context, KPMP, Montgomery Size and Greenwood, Housefields, um, WDL, Wigwam, and Walker Knot. Will you be basing your report by having the discussions with the folks that have been working with the applicants as to what their experience is like to get those things done? Through the, through the chair, um, yes, uh, for sure. So, so of course we're in touch with those um, applicants. And uh, in some cases, we, you know, we have gotten specific feedback um, and we'll look to do an, an exercise to ensure that we get feedback from all applicants. Do you currently have a dashboard for each one of these that shows each a dashboard? We, uh, no, uh, through the chair, uh, no counselor, we don't have a dashboard for each individual applications. Um, they vary in complexity. We have dashboards for some of the more complex ones. Um, others, um, this we don't have individual dashboards for. That is something we could ask for the committee, is it not? 
uh, for the chair, um, I, I, we could look at improving how we um, report back um, uh, a dashboard or, or otherwise improve reporting back. Yeah. The Housing Now has dashboards, is it not? Expedited for all those projects. Um, <laughs> through the chair, yes, we, we do use dashboards for a variety of projects, and yes, the Housing Now projects are very closely monitored through the steering group committee, yes. So does that mean these are, I, I can't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that these aren't closely monitored here. The C2Ks must be closely monitored. Is there no thought of the dashboard so that we really can track rather than? Uh, maybe I could also, uh, through the chair, just comment that actually many of the, the projects on here are monitored also through dashboards on the Rapid Housing Initiative as well. So I think there's room to work with the C2K team to come up with some yes. that harmonizes uh, that reporting. Right. Is this report going to council, by the way, Chair? Yes, it is. We have some time to so work I'll, on some I'll of these things. That. Yeah. 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 Some of these things and the type of, uh, for something that's to be expedited and of such importance that we're hiring a staff for 1.8, is it 1.8 or 1.2 million? It's 1.8 new staff. I think we have to expect 1.1. Chair, it's 1.8. 1.8, so 1.8 million, I would expect a very clear dashboard where this committee is overseeing whether or not we're meeting the goals of spending 1.8 plus our current staff, plus having a C2K. And we do, we do need a way to measure that. So just on some of these, and this related to the next, um, the next one, which has to do with uh, Splagget um well I'll wait till the next item which has to do all these are all affordable except for the modular are they all affordable at low end of market the modulars are not are they just explain that relationship to the 80 percent cmhc's um through the, through the chair, uh, yes, all of the projects here um, include elements of affordability that have been secured over a longer period of time, so between 40, 50, and 99 years. Um, and then um, currently all of the, where we've identified in the table um, that they are um, affordable, um, it clearly identifies the number of units for each at average market rent and also uh, the percentage of AMR. So you can see there that that ranges from uh, kind of 75 to 80 to 100 percent AMR depending on the project. So there is a mix here of affordability, but we're um, being transparent about what that is for each of the projects. Thank you. So 75 percent AMR is the what was that? the 100 percent average question, market counselor. rent would be the 80 percent just want to understand that hundred sorry can you repeat the question counselor well definitely percentage of average market rent a hundred percent so that means a hundred percent of the units or a hundred percent of the average so the um uh, the previous column indicates the number of units right. which are at or below the average market rent, and then the next one talks about the kind of the average depth of affordability that's being provided. And just one more question, Chair. We don't know at what levels these are at, or is that what that's saying? It's 80 of the 80 percent of the 12, or 100 percent of the 120, but we don't know what those actually are. If they're at eighty percent AMR, sixty percent AMR, forty percent AMR, um, I can confirm that for you, Councillor. Just so yeah, that it's that, clear. That would be helpful provided. to understand yeah. uh, okay. in another chart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Perks. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a questions in two areas. Uh, I'll deal with the first with the chief planner. I just want to make sure I understood your answers to Councillor Nunziata. So the concept to keys process isn't just a get out of jail free card uh, <laughs> if you write affordable housing somewhere on your application, right? 
I would agree with that characterization, yes. So if I wanted to do, you know, something which was, you know, deeply, deeply uh, troubling in terms of some other city policy, say employment lands, uh, and I wanted to just do a conversion, I can't just say it's an affordable housing project, take me through concept to keys and skip a bunch of steps. Uh, that's correct. We look for alignment with all of the policies of the official plan. That's why we, we try to pick projects where we're not going to run into big uh, showstopper issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm not sure who the next question is for. I'm looking at recommendation three, which authorizes the mayor and or relevant city officials to accept up to 1.75 million from the province. Uh, but later on says, uh, on terms and conditions satisfactory to the CFO uh, and the city solicitor. So that's different from and or, right? So the, there's still a, a, pub, a, a public service process monitoring that. They, they, the province can't just stand up the mayor and say, here's some money, move this one faster. I, I'm just confused about how that works. Um, through the chair, uh, so Recently, the province announced the Streamline Development Approval Fund, and each yes. city was allocated a specific amount of money. This was through templated letters based on criteria for what they would fund, typically related to accelerating developments, te supporting technology, those types of things. So this recommendation is asking for simply authority from council to be able to accept uh, those funds. Um, we still have to work with the province uh, as part of the transfer agreement. We're going to get very defined criteria on what, uh, what that money can be used for. Um, and one of the things that we, we anticipate based on, you know, the additional feedback we got from them was uh, for this a new file circulation platform that we've been working on. See, the recommendation's a little bit more broad than that. It, it <laughs> uh, you know what? I think I'm going to have to have a conversation maybe with the city solicitor before this gets to council about what authority we're actually handing over. If I can just ask someone in the city solicitor's office to get in touch with my office so I can get a briefing on that before council. It just, <laughs> okay, I'm, I just, I, I worry about transparency and accountability and I just wanna make sure it's covered. Thank you. That's it. Thank yeah. you, councillor. Um, I think that covers everybody. I do have a, a few questions as well. So when we started C2K, um, I, I thought C2K, it's a process that um, it's gonna change the way that we are approving developments. It's gonna be on a teams based. So we're gonna basically have teams from all kinds of divisions working on that project with somebody as a project manager. Are we still on that goal? Is that the goal? Uh, through the chair and uh, to yourself, I think that's that's a, a good way of saying that, Councillor, yes. Okay, so um, that team, is it working through the different applications of the project? Is it the same team? And do you have the authority to review all the applications? So rezoning, if they have a plan of subdivision, if they have site plan, whatever, is it gonna be always the same team? Well, as much as we can, you know, people move and stuff like that, of course, but like, is that the goal? And do you have the authority to review all those applications that come, that are associated with whatever project you guys end up putting in the C2K streamline? Uh, through the chair, if you're talking specifically to priority developments, um, I think we've worked very closely with the commenting partners to delineate certain elements um, of, of an application. Uh, so certainly we still work with city planning, you know, more largely on the front end. Um, and then when we get to approvals, um, you know, that would be obviously, you know, there'd be work with other divisions on, on those. Um, I think for the most part, though, there's no real authority um, that we have to take this on. It's just um, it's a coordination So my, my question is, staff. Chris, so the, 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 the table that you guys decide in consultation with the housing secretary identifies, you know, modular housing X, you know, Trenton, Councillor Bradford. So is the same team that is gonna work 
on the rezoning, gonna work on site plan, gonna work on whatever kinds, of building permits, like is it gonna be the same planner, the same person from transportation, the same person from ECS, the same person from water, this team approach. Are we gonna take it from concept to keys with this team approach and it's gonna be project based? Uh, through the chair, um, I would say that that is that's the end goal, right? The the more we can work as amongst the team, um, the, the quicker the applications will go. To date, um, it's been a little bit application specific. We have taken over um, some um, early elements on some files, but if the uh, you know if there's a will for us to expand, um, certainly that's something that we're we're happy to look at. So that's my question: the will to have it this way. Do you have delegated authority to do that, or do we have to give you through motion in here or at council to say, make sure that you're dealing on a project basis? Because I'm sure that a lot of my colleagues can relate to that sometimes, you know, things are approved at the rezoning and then a new team comes or a new planner and then all we go back to the drawing board because he said, she said, it's not like it is. So we think if we want to speed things up, this idea of the team, I think that's what really excited a lot of us <laughs> in having a consistency through the process. Um, so do you have the, the authority or do you need any direction from council? Um, I, uh, through the chair, um, I, again, I don't know if it's a question of having the authority, um, but if, if council would like uh, to direct us to, to take over a larger aspect of things, it's certainly something that we could, uh, we could do. Okay. I guess, I guess we'll, we'll discuss from now until council. I think it's better to take it offline. I, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, with regards to the 20 applications, so this is the 20 applications that we've identified for 2022. Uh, through the chair, Dennis, can you comment on that? Through the chair, uh, in the attachment to this report, that uh, reflects the applications that are currently under review and assigned to the team. Um, so, uh, you know, as additional applications are submitted in 2022, um, so for example, we're expected additional applications this week, they would be added to this. Okay. And are these, are you looking at these as applications or are you looking at these as projects right now? How are you uh, doing your work plan? Yeah, um, through, through the chair. We're looking at them um, as, as applications where, where projects have multiple applications that have yeah. been assigned to our team, then we're looking at those in coordination. Um, you know, I, th I think to your earlier question, uh, Deputy Mayor, in, in some cases we've made delineations where, um, for example, rezoning was done by a separate team and then handed um, and then assigned to our uh, party review team at site plan. And I, and I think that's what we're looking at um, is it, just to make sure that that is um, you know, the, the, the most effective, or that we're, that we're looking at the projects in the most effective way. Um, currently some projects, we have multiple applications we consider to others. In other cases, we, you know, zoning is complete and, and we're taking it from site plan forward. Okay, and my, my last question, Chris, so we have now the C2K and we have the, the, the teams that are doing the day-to-day -day work on the process. Do you have a team that continues to work on the implementation of this new process? So you need to look into technology advancements, process advancements, you know, all that stuff. Are we not, like, can you give us some peace of mind that we're not tapping into those resources? Because, you know, we, we know that we can overwhelm stuff sometimes as well. and and. Do we have two separate teams, one doing the day-to-day -day operations and continuing to have a team that is continuing on the improvement of the process, technology advancements, and the implementation of C2K? Uh, through the chair, uh, thanks very much for the question. Yeah, absolutely, uh, C2K has uh, 30 dedicated staff right now, 
and um, of that, um, there's kind of five five managers with five uh, so five separate streams. Two of the, those are operations, and three are operations support. With exactly what you just described. Uh, one of those streams is focusing on technology. One of them is focusing on new process improvements, um, and then general. Um, you know, we work to support the operations. And so, as we roll out new transformations and new processes, there's training, there's engagement that's done with both staff and industry to make sure it's well supported when it comes in. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our question. Speakers on the item. Madam Chair, Madam yep. Chair, yep. sorry to interrupt, but somebody has their mic on because there's an awful lot of noise. So I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it seems- I can't, kind yeah. of paper shuffling. Yeah, paper, paper shuffling. shuffling. So, yeah. Okay. You can Chair, uh, Chair, if I, could, if I can interrupt what it is, it, it, this is often a thing that happens in council. When you are asking questions of staff, you need to turn your microphone off every time they're answering. It, it's, it's the committee room feedback that we're getting. Okay, thank you. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> if not, please just start waving. <laughs> okay. If you don't, she will remind you, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> okay, um, speakers on the item. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, hi. Um, I, I just want to reiterate a few things as far as the, um, as far as just the reporting out. And this is such an important thing too. There's that many staff, we're hiring more staff, and uh, the completion of these in the quickest way of, is our goal, as you've said, Madam Chair. That's why we've set this up. That's why it sits under at the city manager level in order to expedite. So just, um, it's helpful as far, uh, I'm going to really insist, uh, will the council be moving a motion that we have a dashboard approach that we have this monthly, so we're able to see exactly where things are. And it, you can you can make sure you don't have any bottlenecks because you know it's going to be coming, you know it's going to be coming to council. Even here, I know it's all alphabetical, but having things that are under review, having things that are under NOAC, having things that are out for permit, if you don't have a dashboard, I think that's far more a, uh, a clear way to report. And also note, it's impossible to print this list from the uh, clerk's portal, even under Timis, not the not the CMP, but the regular. I could not get that um, to work. So if somebody could check that, that would be great. I really am um, going to talk a little bit more about this under the next one because I want to know how the new portable housing portal uh, will work with this many complicated, this many complicated projects, this many folks who are delivering them. But I do note when we said let's make sure, let's find out what the issues might be, the underlying issues that we should actually understand if they're. A, Mr. Lantern talks about showstoppers. Well, I've got a couple, one at least that has a showstopper. It is actively being a showstopper, and it has to do with underground infrastructure. And I understand there's a couple of other ones that we're now finding, ooh, that's a sewer, that's this, that makes it very complicated. So the kind of check, and I'm not sure where that takes place as to how difficult this is going to be to start that and I am talking about the Don Somerville project which is here at CTK which has the city's Coxwell sewer running under it which has um, easements related to the main sewer as I say to everybody if you're in Scarborough, North York, Toronto you flush your toilet it's going to the main sewage treatment plant and there's that Coxwell sewer coming from the north so that's a pretty big deal. I'm not sure how that got factored in. I'm still trying to figure that out because that's slowing everything down. And then are these plants contaminated? To what degree are they contaminated? Are there other problems with uh, having to reconfigure, move people, all of those kinds of things? So I know we're just starting and I think it's our on the ground experience is really good to be able to have a another set of checklists while we're determining whether we're starting something or how difficult it's going to be or what it will take to unravel something. Um, we'll start seeing that with a dashboard monthly where things are either happening or not. This little 
wobble at the dawn. Somerville's been going on since September. It's now February. We still don't have it fixed. I'm really looking forward to a way to do that. And then we have other information coming up. So um, none of that is, is um, I guess what I'm saying is, these are all city divisions. This is our city CTK. We need, once we run into problems, we need to know they're being dealt with, that everybody's got their eye on this, that we're going to push through, and we're going to be able to get these moving as quickly as possible. I like the uh, questions that people have asked. I think that what you're facing is all of us have a lot of experience with development. We're not city staff, but man, we've started things, made sure things are happening. All of us have had to make calls to various city divisions to say, what's going on? What's the problem with a building permit, with whatever, in order to accomplish uh, good things in the city? So look forward to continuing to perfect what is a really important step forward, which is to find a way to deliver the affordable housing that we've agreed we want to build in the fastest, cleanest, um, most professional way possible. And I think this is a great start. So thank you very much for this report. And I look forward to you being able to reconfigure some of this to give us a clearer picture and identify where extra, extra oomph is needed to take these over the finish line. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers on the item? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, um, Speaker, and it's great to see uh, the, the concepts, the keys program being advanced. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple of observations that I make, um, and I want to associate myself with uh, Councillor Fletcher's observations, because uh, I think they were also incredibly astute. Um, city planning already has significant challenges, I mean, especially in Toronto Shore Community Council, especially in the downtown core in avenues, centers, um, we're already seeing a significant backlog of, uh, of files that are sitting on planners' desks. The applications are large, they're very, very complicated, whether they include affordable housing or not. So I really like the idea of sort of prioritizing when an application actually has great city building initiatives baked into it. And of course, affordable housing is one of them. I am mindful that you know the the concepts to keys program doesn't all doesn't really help the, the rest of the challenges that we are experiencing and observing uh, in um, in city planning, and and you know the planners I work with and we all work with exceptional community planners, um, you know I, I just want to say like you know they're really under the gun right now, between you know all the big changes that are happening at the province with the rapid speculation that's happening out in the sector, um, the fact that we have uh, applications that have been approved through the you know, through municipal or perhaps you know, uh, provincial process or through the OMB or, or what have you, five years ago, people are coming back with new applications asking for 20 stories on top of 70 stories. Like, this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing in the core of the city, and I know that this is happening in Midtown and in North York along the growth uh, uh, portions. And I guess I just want to flag that as we move through the budget process, which is our opportunity to ask um, and provide more resources to staff and the planning department in particular, is that I've got planners who are working in the downtown core who are sitting with 20, 30, 40 complicated files. And from what I can tell, a lot of these planners are, are, are really challenged with how to complete their work with, with the type of intelligence and professional integrity that they already have embedded in them, but they just have no time to get the work done in an efficient manner. It really brings their, their whole self to it. On top of that, we have other divisions that are overworked and stretched far too thin, and our planners are chasing the other divisions for their comments. And, and notably, one that always seems to be delinquent in, in providing comments in a timely fashion is uh, is engineering construction services. Um, so I just want to, I, I just think it was important for us to not just talk about how we're going to address one portion of the planning process that seems to be well under resourced and, and to me needs those resources to in order for us to advance affordable housing. 
But there are so many other challenges, as I see it, right now in community planning. And I hope that our committee and the, the committee members here will speak up during the budget process to really advocate so we can have more resources for our planning staff, our urban designers, everybody that works within the division who seems to be so stretched. Not to mention that I'm losing, and actually this is what's happening here, is that really great planners are leaving. They're leaving for other municipalities who are getting paid uh, comparable or better wages um, and with lesser work. Um, they're leaving, uh, and I, from what I can tell, they're leaving with the intelligence and the institutional memory that we need here in order for us to plan and build these brilliant, inclusive, beautiful neighborhoods and dynamic financial centers that we're looking for. And I'm very worried, extremely worried, about the state of community planning right now, especially in light of what is happening with the dramatic, big, draconian changes that are coming from the province. Some things we can control, some things we cannot. I can't control what Doug Ford does. But certainly as a councillor who cares deeply about how we build our city and our neighbourhood, I can certainly try to control the planning process, or control the budget process, I should say, or influence it, so that our planning staff can stay, be proud to be part of a team that works so brilliantly to protect and to plan our beautiful city for all of us, healthy, inclusive. And, and so I, I really hope that that's going to be part of our narrative as we bring this report to council. Thank you very much. Thank you, councillor. Any other councillors that would like to speak on this item? I, I would say a few words uh, and I'll move recommendations. I think this is extremely important work that is getting done in here. I think that yes, um, we're um, receiving lots of planning applications that is, are, is putting a lot of pressure in all kinds of our departments because you know when a planning application um, comes through, we all and if there's something right or something wrong, you know, we usually t try to blame the planning department, but the reality is that there's, you know, um, a whole of government uh, that needs to be involved because this is circulated by our agencies. This is uh, through transportation, ECS, and so on. I just want to um, um, make sure that people understand that, yes, we are hiring more people in those departments. The recommendation that we have in front of us it's actually to hire more people in planning, in ECS, in parks, to facilitate the approval of, of the applications. Yes, there's gonna be uh, the priority when we started C2K was with affordable housing, is still a key item and, and a key priority for this council, so we'll continue to have that as a stream. But we've already launched this in Etobicoke, and by the end of the year, it'll be launched citywide. C2K is not a team, C2K is a process. That's why I made, uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that I understood it right. This is a, a new process of approval of development applications that we started by implementing and piloted in affordable housing and that now is in Etobicoke and by the end of the year is gonna be in all uh, uh, community councils. So it will support all of us. They have identified that not only do we need to bring new technology, not only do we need to bring new processes, but they have identified that staff in all these departments is also important as well. And that's why this report is actually having a recommendation to hire people in those reports as well. Because you can change all the process, bring all the technology, you know, if you don't have people approving the applications and reviewing the applications and doing all that work, you know, it's not gonna get any faster. So I think the C2K team recognized that. So. I think this is extremely important process. I think it's still being fine-tuned. That's why it is so important that we give them the adequate uh, feedback um, that they need. I really think that the idea of having the, these teams looking at the project and be truly a concept to keys from you know the, the moment that we have the application coming in to the time that we have somebody housed. That's, that's the time that matters. You know, the zoning application, if we reduce two months, but then if the plan of subdivision, we increase six months, is not gonna get me any faster. We need to make sure that from the time we have a project coming in, we evaluate it with the merits and all the issues, but that we take it through until we have somebody being, being housed. And so that's what, what I always understood this process was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a full review, full implementation, and I really think we need to start moving on, on projects. But I, I'm, I'm you know, really excited that by the end of the year, 
all community councils are going to have this new process uh, that, like I said, I think the team is very much looking forward to getting feedback from all, all of us because it is true, I think some of my colleagues mentioned here, we, we deal with the, these on a daily basis. Sometimes we become project managers ourselves. Our counselor's office are sometimes project managers and I haven't met one counselor that likes that. I think we are very much looking forward to have a team that can take that task and that, that, and that can take that role so we don't, we don't get those calls. So uh, with that, I think that there might be some conversations happening from now until council on a couple of motions, but I think we're ready. We'll move it here and we'll continue to speak with staff and give them that, the, the feedback. We'll move the recommendations and, and, deal, and fine tune it at, at council as well. Okay, all those in favor of the report? That carries, okay. Next item, 31.5. Uh, new centralized affordable housing access system, consultation findings and concept design. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, you've held the item. Do you have questions of staff? Councillor Fletcher, item five, you've held the item. Do you have questions of staff? Councillor Fletcher might be getting another call. Is there anybody else that has questions of staff on this item? Councillor Bradford. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Just a couple quick questions. Um, are staff able to tell us about the initial feedback on the My Access Housing TO system? Um, has that come up in the consultation that's re reflected in the report here? Feedback on that piece? Um, through the through the chair, maybe I'll start um, and then ask uh, my colleague Doug Rawlins to jump in on the specifics around my access TO. Um, one of the things we heard clearly through the consultation that we've most recently done um, is that people want a very clear interface between the two systems. So they don't want to have to kind of apply through my access and then have to enter all their information. They want one point of access where they can apply for units through my access uh, TO and also through the new access system for affordable housing. I don't know Doug, if you want to add anything to that. Sure, thank you. I've been through the chair to the councillor. Um, we are now into cycle three of the launch of uh, my accent TO for rent gear to income housing. And so far, uh, the responses have been good. We've been getting a number of questions through um, applicants and partners to provide assistance with the new portal, which we've been able to manage through our partnership with SDFA and the Access Centre support, plus our housing provider training uh, and our partner training with shelters and other housing help centres, et cetera, has been really valuable and helpful. We continue to get feedback through an online survey as well as doing in-person phone call interviews for applicants invited to and participated through the system and we'll be reporting back through council and committee in April this year with feedback on the implementation and our goals to increase participation rates as we move along the process. Um, is the thinking around, around this program as with the, the RGI housing applicants for affordable housing will be required to actively indicate interest in specific units during two week cycles uh yeah again i think the the, the key message we got back from the feedback and we've received from counselors and others is the the disparate system to apply for people in need of housing is challenging and we want to route people through one window access so they can complete one application form get assessed for eligibility in terms of what units they are able to apply for um, based on unit size and their income as well as priority and then provide them opportunity and information on the available vacancies so they can make a more informed housing choice in a more sophisticated and current way utilizing technology uh, phone channels or in-person counters if required but to modernize it the cho the, the current the former uh, waiting list for your income housing was based on 20 year old technology and it was in dire need of an upgrade. And when we went through the process to uh, input, input in place, we kept in mind that this would be a vehicle to support more broader housing access in general, uh, including the next phase, which is the affordable housing. Okay, thanks, Doug. I guess last last question. Uh, you talked about there's a there's a phone element. Uh, I think you just said in person counter. Um, those residents who are, you know, without access to a computer, 
how does the uh, how does the program and the one window sort of serve them? How are we making sure that uh, they're able to participate and plug into the program? Sure, through a host of channels. So we've provided written correspondence to all 80,000 households on the rent to income waitlist in multi-language to provide them opportunities to get seek assistance. So that can happen in a variety of ways. They can call the uh, application support center. Um, they can go to a local housing help center, um, a library. Uh, all of our shelter and homelessness providers are able to assist. Uh, we've had a little bit of a challenge up front because our front counters have been closed down, but we're hoping with the reopening we'll have those channels available as well, uh, and we'll continue to explore partnerships and opportunities to um, build on the partnerships and to respond to feedback we receive from people who are using the system. Are you tracking via percentage or number of applications, for example, or numbers of pieces of correspondence that come in online versus other channels? Could you tell me? I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you how many people have used the phone versus how many people have, have gone through our, our shelter system versus how many people have gone over the counter. I understand that's not open. Sure. Do you actually know how people are engaging with the system? Sure. Actually, one of the, the ironically, one of the one of the, the bigger challenges we have is a lot more data than we've ever have. So trying to sort through it to to um, provide us with the right information to tell the story and the impact of changes in the implementation and the impact they're having on frontline is something we're working through on a on a daily, uh, if not weekly basis, or weekly if not daily basis. And so we have a lot more indications in terms of how many people are calling, who's applying, who was invited to apply, who picked up the phone. And again, we're trying to use that data to tell us a story of how the implementation is going and then append that with those um, person to person phone channel and survey reaches which will provide the more subjective uh, information to let us know how we're doing. And again, we'll roll that up for uh, you counselor um, uh, in a report back that's that's pending in April. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, counselor. Any other questions, uh, counselors with questions? Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you, and uh, Doug, thanks for I'm your... sorry. Go ahead, Councillor. Councillor Carroll, do you have questions on this item? Sorry, I keep emailing in that I have questions, but they, it does not seem to be getting to you. Okay. I have questions on this item that I that I I, I uh, sent in the short term, but rather a while ago I sent on item six. So these are the only two items that I have outstanding questions. Yeah, I, this um, is not item six, this is item five, Councillor. Right, I have questions on this one. Okay. I, I just emailed, it, it may okay. not have reached you in time. Okay, I'm go just ahead. flagging for you in advance that I also sent one on six. So on this one, I'm really struggling. I, I found it hard to read the report because it was hard to tell what were concerns in current state of the, the social housing waiting list and what um, speaks to the current affordable housing um, such as the lottery system so in the future state map as near as I can see is, is what we're getting to is making people aware of applications as they come is the system for actually getting the units still going to at the end of the day be a lottery and through the chair, maybe I'll um, start the answer to this question. Um, so the feedback uh, through the chair, the feedback that we received from people is that the consensus seems to be that an element of a lottery system is a fair way to provide people access. In addition, though, staff are continuing to work on how we also include an equity focus as well. So we. I, I think we're in a good place. We've received a lot of feedback, but we haven't completed the work yet to figure out how to include an equity focus uh, into the system that we build. And that could be through a combination of, you know, targeted lottery or also referral agreements from partners. But Doug, did you want to add anything to that? No, the only thing I would add, um, Abby, and thanks for the question, uh, Councillor, is that we'll also be looking to provide deeper affordability with those affordable housing projects by including a portion of a rent gear to income, which would again come through that one window access approach. So again, the, the, the opportunity here is to funnel people through one window where they can be provided opportunities to understand what they qualify for, and then in the back end to work with our partners so they can utilize that technology to fill units faster. So. I'm kind of shocked <laughs> at this point. 
part of the reason this report is before us, I made a motion at the beginning of this term to look at access to mid-range affordable housing because I was inundated with complaints that it's done by a lottery system. So it's shocking to me that we held a consultation and that want to keep the lottery system. Um, and I'm wondering how that consultation was carried out because I'm, I'm fairly vigilant about making sure that consultations are promoted in, in my ward and that, that people take part in these things. And so I'm, I'm going to assume that the complaints I was getting were from my ward, but people were really suspicious of and frustrated by the lottery system. But, but what you're telling me is you carried out a consultation and came back with, this is what the community wants. Um, how was that carried out? Um, through the chairs, there was a wide range of consultation that was done through people, uh, potential applicants, uh, previous applicants, including, um, you know, nonprofit partners who may support people's applications and private sector organizations as well, and landlords who may provide housing. So it was a full range of consultation that we did, uh, specifically. Um, in relation to how many people considered a lottery system to be a fair approach. Um, that was around three quarters of the people that we spoke to considered, gave us feedback. So it wasn't, um, as I said, it was a consensus rather than everyone that we spoke to thinks the lottery is a sure. good idea. Everyone understands the, the limits that a lottery provides us. But generally speaking, the feedback that we had was that it was the fairest system uh, that people identified. Sure. So I hear I heard not for profits representing people. I heard. So we did talk to people who had who had been applicants in multiple lotteries. I'm going to let Doug answer the question specifically about on the consultation who we spoke to. Thanks. Yes, yes, that's correct. We um, we did discuss people who participated in future lotteries, and I think also if I can if I can um, glean a bit what we heard you, from. Right I think here. you meant to say past. You meant to say past lotteries. You just said. Participating in future lotteries. Okay, thank you. Just want to be clear. Yeah, that's fair enough. My apologies for that. Uh, I think we, we also heard from our consultation uh, on the rent your income um, approach and choice based in general or lotteries is we need to do a better job of letting people know the outcomes of those processes so that they're aware uh, of the scale and, and the depth of those. Um, we also need to provide, to your point, targeted approaches to deal with the equity seeking groups, whether that is income based, racially based, uh, or other categories. And that report back in June that we're coming to council will lay out some of our recommendation and thoughts on that process to make sure that there's an opportunity for all uh, people to access affordable housing, but we're uh, clearly setting targets uh, and creating processes to ensure um, those equi equity seeking groups um, have more specific access targets and options. Okay. My last question is a protest question. The, the final report on this is coming um, to, to, to council, it, I think uh, after the second quarter, but this report that the only recommendation is receipt Will, will the rest of council see this? Will this report be on the council agenda? Or if we receive it, does it just um, get forwarded back to staff and, and, and council will only see the final report? Um, through the chair, yeah, it, it was our intention that this be re received for information and that it is the final report that we bring back um, that um, council will see. The one we bring Let's receive for last question. Will it not appear now. on the council agenda later this month? Um, at this point, staff have recommended that it just be received and not be um, seen by council later this month, but that obviously c could be um, changed at the wish of this committee. Thank you, Councillor. Um, okay, thank you. Thank Councillor you. Wong Tam. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, just a couple of quick follow-up questions. Um, does the city, does, does your division have the resources necessary to uh, to roll out this new centralized waitlist? Like, do you have everything you need? Staff, resources, technology. Um, again, thank you through the Chair. Maybe I'll, I'll start the answer to this question. So we, um, uh, and Doug, you can fill in some additional information about your HSS team. Um, we have included, there is um, 
resources that have been um, identified and requested through the, the budget that's currently before, before Council. And obviously, as we begin the process to roll out this new access point, then it's likely we will have additional requests for resources in, but in the budget later this year for 2023. Okay, thank you. But um, did you want to add anything to that in terms of our current resources? No, no, that's correct. We we have um, uh, we will be bringing forward the report, which will outline the, the capital cost of the program and the operating impact capital. And council will also know at that point um, how we're doing with supporting the people through um, the the choice base, whether there's any deficits there, which will inform uh, our work and our resource requirements moving forward. Okay, thank you. And so we've seen other divisions struggle with uh, the adaptation of new technology or perhaps new programs or procurement. Uh, recreation services is one of them that I've been chasing for 11 years since my time here at Council. Um, so I'm just uh, mindful that sometimes the, the planning and the implementation doesn't always run as smoothly as, as one would like. So understanding that as a, a sort of a, a backgrounder, how, how, do, how do you plan to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen in other divisions when it comes to, number one, developing a new program, um, rolling out its implementation and managing a large um, data set of, uh, of information that has variable inputs that have to come in from what I, I believe are multiple agencies and their centralized information. How do you plan to do that? So again, Councillor, through the chair, um, one of the things I think has been most helpful is the launch of my access TO. We will learn an incredible amount through that process that we will be able to leverage for this new um, one window system and it's really about building on that and the lessons that we learn. In addition, we're utilizing our CXI team at the city who have been really helpful in identifying how we use technology and making sure that it matches the needs of the users and the residents as well. So that's, um, they are a really important part of the process and a part of the project team that are developing this new technology. Um, Doug, do you want to add anything specifically? Yeah, I think the partnership with uh, with our innovation team and with the core uh, City Toronto IT team has been exceptional. Uh, and I think one of the things we've been able to do within the development stage of rolling out um, a large complex capital project, even in the midst of COVID with the additional challenges it's provided, is the ability to stage this, to, to start slow, to pilot, to monitor, to measure and adjust, uh, and then to have good communication channels open with all of our stakeholders through the implementation so we can again, get intelligent, uh, find out how it's being implemented, and adjust uh, and stay on course. Um, okay, thank, so, yeah. thank you. Um, and so because the, the program is expected to launch in 2023, um, it, are there contingency plans on, for example, not being able to meet that target? That's one question. And then the, the next question is regarding the integrity of the process. So the, this is, you know, it's, it's almost like the Hunger Games when it comes to getting access uh, getting onto the waitlist, staying on the waitlist, and then getting access to that, you know, that chosen unit when it's finally offered to you. So how do you intend to make sure it's launched on time, but also also to in protect the integrity of, of that information that you're, you're collecting, but also the integrity of the process of when um, units are being offered or RGIs are being offered to, to, um, to folks on the waitlist so that they don't lose their spot and and that they believe in the process, they believe in this wait list, they, they know it's the way to get, get to housing affordability. Um, through the chair, councillor, um, I will let Doug talk about access for RGI units, but I think to your point about the desire for from our community to get access to a system like this, and specifically how it enables them to access affordable housing. There are a number of things, we're not actually waiting until 2023. There are a number of things that we're trying to do to improve people's access. Uh, we're launching a new list serve so that people can subscribe to that and receive notifications about new affordable housing. We're also updating the city's um, housing website as an important landing page right now, and as well as developing public education materials so that people are in prior to 2023 and prior to the launch of this new portal that they're aware of how they can access current um, opportunities. And Doug, do you want to add about specifically integrity around the RGI access? 
Sure. So I think it starts with a system that's designed on a, on a fair and transparent basis and our ability on two fronts, so the applicant facing and the housing provider facing, to continue to do uh, the best job to provide customer service and ensure compliance to the rules and the requirements um, of participating in or using the list. And those have quite different um, uh, rollouts, but both are actively and underway. On the, on the client side, I do think it comes down to communication, communication, and communication, and the ability to um, have multiple channels for people to seek information and to seek assistance. Uh, and also, um, if there is a, a negative outcome that, that comes about because of a lack of connection with their office or failure to meet their requirements to up, up, uh, uphold their eligibility, having those processes in place to work one-on-one -on -one of the household um, to get back on the list um, and assist them uh, as they can be. And, and on the housing provider side, uh, working with the program teams to monitor uh, the use of the system, create periodic uh, audits, and to be able to use the system to demonstrate uh, where it's working and where it's not. So that is all happening. Uh, as we roll out, uh, we have uh, some, um, some pieces put in place now, but we'll be building on those, uh, vetting those, and making sure that they do it. But it comes down to, I think, Councillor, communication and, and transparency on the process uh, for applicants. Thank you. That Thank was, you, uh, Thank those you. are your questions. Any other councillors with questions of staff? Yes, I have questions. Councillor Fletcher. Sure. Um, okay. I just want to know, I'm going back to what we had in front of us earlier, which is all the list of, of the affordable housing in the C2K. And looking at, um, I'm just going to go to one which is the trustees of the St. Luke's Congregation of the UCC. It's on Sherburn Street. There are 30 units, and they are 100% AMR. When those are built in this system, are those units going to be posted somewhere? What's the process for those units? Or does the United Church believe that they are able to allot those units? Um, through the chair, so we always work as with applicants on an access plan um, and we work with them to ensure as far as we're working towards this one portal access system. So we're working with applicants um, so that they understand that ultimately any uh, projects delivered, affordable housing delivered in the City of Toronto where the City has invested incentives or supported that project, we want this to be made available through this one window portal. Until the portal is available, we're still working with applicants to make sure that they understand our goals here for fair and equitable access. And in the short term, if, if the units are available before the portal is up and running, then it may need a um, slightly different approach, as I indicated through a list, a list of, but that is part of what we, we are trying to negotiate okay. through our agreements. So when the portal is up and running and they've agreed and they're getting all the open door and everything else, then those units will go on the portal. Simple as that, right? But right That's now correct. we're not and they're not ready. So number one, on an RGI wait list, once you're on at the top, that is how the wait list works. It's a wait list. So you put your name in for an RGI unit and next one that comes up, and let's say it's a three bedroom and you want a one bedroom, you get told there's a three bedroom available. No, you're waiting for a one. Let's do the other way. There's a one bedroom available, you're waiting for three uh, to the next person. So it cascades down the list until that unit's filled. I want you to confirm that. Maybe I can speak to that, uh, Abby. So yeah, with the choice-based system, we, we, we invite people with a, with a high, who've been waiting for the longest on the waiting list or who have priority in the wait list. We make them available of units that are available. Um, they assess the location, uh, their willingness to move at this right. time, and yeah. they, they express their interest. And the person who has the highest priority, who has been waiting the longest, will get allocated that unit. And so, but we're not thinking of anything of that nature with the affordable. So you could move into the city from Brampton, put your name on the list, and there's your lottery. Somebody's been waiting for five years for an affordable unit, and they're not going to have access. So we have no, we don't have the same principle when we're dealing with affordable units, even though some of them are at 80%, some of them are at 60%, some of them are at 40%, which is almost an RGI unit. 
Yeah, so I think we're going to need to look at some of those uh, units that are particularly below 80%, uh, recognizing that that is a benefit that, to your point, is equal to, or in some cases perhaps more than a rent gear tin income unit, and we'll need to um, uh, assess and bring forward to, to Council in that June report how we'll address those units, Councillor Fletcher, and I, I think it will likely be more um, uh, akin to the, the rent gear tin right. income uh, need-based uh, allocation. How about the person moving in from Aurelia? That puts their name on, goes online, puts their name on, now they're in the lottery, and they've been here for a month. Well, quite similarly to you, to, to be on the rent gear to income, uh, you know, the only eligibility criteria is that you're you're legally entitled to live in Canada. So we can have people yeah. uh, in the yeah, same circumstances um, apply for rent gear to income. Um, I, I don't think look. you're getting my meaning. Sorry. Okay, perhaps not. Reference. Perhaps not. My meaning is on the RGI, you have a lot of people that have been waiting for a long time, and we start with who's been waiting, and they get offered first on the what you're proposing is that we have a list where it doesn't matter if you've been out waiting for four years or five years, somebody who comes in at the end or the week before is now in the lottery. Is, is yes or no? Uh, through the chair, that is the, the lottery approach um, you. that you describe is what people told us they thought would be fairest for affordable housing. Thank you. The only caveat to that is those more deeply subsidized. I understand, but it's up to council and city council to decide exactly what that will look like. That's will correct. Will it be a free for all? So let me give you another example Last question, for an art space one. Pardon? Last question. Okay, you know what? We're going to have to come back and do a couple more rounds. This is the first time we've been able to discuss this, Chair. Would you like me to make that motion? Councillor, just go ahead and ask the question. Thank you. Um, I'm just interested in an arts-based. There are some arts-based uh, housing. And does that go through a um, partner? Let's say Artscape. Um, through the chair, as indicated, we, we do um, organize specific access plans with proponents. And if there are eligibility criteria that is tied to that type of housing, it could be um, housing for artists or it could be seniors, it could be a variety of yep. things where there is a specific target group. We are also working to um, supplement this lottery approach with something that will help us achieve and match the right people to those homes. So it could be um, an additional approach where we're able to target um, target I, that lottery approach. I have very the right specific person. questions about, let's take the waterfront arts units. I don't know how many there are that were built in the Daniels building. But they were built for artists. So the process for bringing people into those is left with our criteria, but by the by the partner agency for, their, for them to develop criteria as well, correct? And um, through the chair, um, in addition to the access agreement we also use referral agreements for that type of housing right now yes so that they're able we to don't identify do it. that it's left up to that partner to make the final decision what's the oversight over the partner um through the chair so the referral agreements are over uh, the oversight is provided um by us we we check to see that the eligibility criteria that they identified up front is is met during that process and we ask them for confirmation and a report out on those criteria. Um, we are though looking at, in addition to the example that you brought up, you've identified artist housing, for example, and that does make sense to have, um, you know, referral agreements and have that done, managed by the provider. There may be other equity groups where we need to create a slightly different process where we want to increase um, availability for housing for certain equity deserving groups. So for artist housing, yes, uh, I'm going to want to see that referral agreement. I'm very interested in our oversight and um, as being something that they're very few and far between. As well with the co-ops, and we are building a lot of housing that we're referring for co-op. It will be run or administered through a co-op. What will the co-op, will they have anything to do with it? They have a wait list or they, I know they're probably on the, uh, 
on the RGI wait list, but if it's not an RGI, what's the current method that they use to fill housing? Okay, last question, Councillor. Um, through the chair, I'll just say our access plans are man monitored annually. Um, for those units which are co-op, which may be similar to RGI units, Doug, did you want to confirm the approach there for those units? Please. Sure, all rank year 10 come units will go through the, the centralized waiting list, except if they have a specific mandate. Uh, and I think Abby mentioned a, a few of those examples. For the market rent units, or, so for those that are not rank year 10 come, the, uh, the co-op has autonomy to decide who uh, who's selected for uh, and for those units. Thank you. Any Very other questions? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Councillor uh, Nunziata. Yes, I, I just have one question. I don't know if the question was asked previously, but I have to step out. Um, is priority given um, in, in an area where um, seniors or residents live within that community? Is priority given to those residents rather than people from outside the community? Um, through the chair, for the affordable housing units, which is the, the report that you see in front of you, which is this new system, one portal that we're creating, um, we're proposing to use all the feedback we received through the consultation that was that people thought, you know, a randomized lottery was the most fair uh, access system that we could come up with. Uh, but in addition to that, we are looking at ways to support equity deserving groups. So if a building has a particular focus to it, um, developed by the nonprofit or provider, for example, seniors, uh, then we will work through the access plans and through referral agreements to make sure that those can be targeted. But generally speaking, the housing will become um, as likely that's the feedback that we've received should be available through a lottery system. Yeah, so other than lottery system, because um, so there is a senior's affordable housing building going up in my ward on Western Road. Uh, uh, the chair knows about this. So we're getting a lot of calls from seniors in the area wanting, um, you know, to apply for it. So um, why wouldn't they have priority if they live within the um, the community that they're waiting so and, right and they're not on the, they're not on the lottery list they're just you know right. inquiring yeah i see through the through the chair thank you councillor nunziata and if there are specifics that we need to follow up on with regard to that particular building then we can do that i would encourage at, at this point we are um utilizing a list of process where people can put their name forward um, for particular buildings, but if that particular building that you're referring to is a seniors building, it's likely that we have a an access plan or a referral arrangement with the the provider of that building. But I'd be happy to follow up with you offline about the specifics there. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Perks. Sorry, I, I guess the piece that I'm trying to understand is if we're you know, setting aside the RGI issue, I'm thinking now about the ones where we're doing lotteries. How is that, like, who finds out about that? Um, thank you, Councillor. That's a, that's a great question. We're beginning the public engagement already ahead of the portal system. I mean, one of the challenges is if the, the best way to provide people equitable access is to do a one-window system so people can sign up um, can enter their details for not just one particular building, but to be notified about future opportunities um, and also to put themselves forward for particular buildings and opportunities. So we're going to be, in addition to that one window portal, beginning public engagement this year ahead of time, learning the lessons from Access TO. Um, but it's going to be an important part of the success of the new system when we launch it in 2023 is so that people know where to go even if there are, isn't a particular building immediately that they're interested in that they sign up to get notification and be involved and be able to be offered um, units. So uh, what I didn't hear there is proactively reaching out to certain target uh, groups of people or, or anything like that. I heard if someone has, takes the initiative to sign up, then they go on a list. But how do we get them to that sign-up moment? 
Yes, councillor, through the chair, you're you're absolutely right. And this has been a big, it is a big learning right now in the My Access TO work is how proactive the staff team have to be to make sure that the right, uh, the right organisations know about it and can talk to their members and stakeholders and residents about getting people signed up. So it is our intention to be proactive about this. Um, and I guess through a public education campaign, making sure that people are aware um, about this process, this new process that we will have, um, and that using that public education campaign, perhaps through individual organizations, community-based organizations who have better access to people to let them know that this is coming and to help them sign up if necessary. Yeah, I'm gonna need to think more on this. I, I mean, there are, uh, I'm aware that, so for example, uh, I'm forgetting the affordable home ownership program. They maintain that they've gone and looked at a variety of different lists, people who are on waiting lists for co-op space and so on and so forth. There are lists and so on out there. And I just, I, I would feel more comfortable if you were bringing us something today that was more thought out in terms of, you know, not just saying we'll do a public awareness campaign, but here are the ways we're targeting people who might be shopping around. Um, thanks, Councillor. Through the chair, so I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying that because there are a number of existing lists out there that people have already put themselves on a variety of different lists, that um, you're interested in us developing a specific kind of engagement consultation plan, which is about making sure that those people on the list are somehow incorporated in um, our work more directly, that there's a... And proactively uh, communicating yeah. to people. We understand for X, Y, or Z reason uh, that um, you are uh, perhaps underhoused or, or in some other way would be interested in this program. So we are getting in contact with you personally to encourage you to sign up. Okay, um, thank you, Councillor. We can certainly um, take on board your comments and feedback and make sure that we provide more information about what that kind of engagement looks like in June when we come back. And in okay. the meantime, we can, if there are, if you have ide specific ideas beyond, you know, where we should be targeting, we're also happy to connect with you about that and make sure that there are specific yeah. organizations or less that are included in that targeted approach. I'll get to work on a lengthy email for you. Many thanks, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions of staff? I have a couple of questions. So, um, there's right now, there's a lot of uh, affordable housing that uh, we get into partnerships, and so a lot of the nonprofits, they promote the units themselves. But this um, will also include any units, for example, that we're gonna get through inclusionary zoning, uh, any rental replacement. So the idea is that, you know, if you're in a, all of a sudden see yourself in a tough situation and need affordable housing, that there's this central portal that at least gives you what's out there. It's just not because you happen to contact, you were lucky enough to contact one organization or lucky enough to walk through the building and see it, there's a central, um, a, a portal that has all the units that are going to become available. Is that the intent of this of this uh, uh, access point? Um, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. This is about providing fairer, equitable, and more comprehensive access for all of the opportunities that will be coming. Um, as you identified, we're seeing an increase in the number of affordable housing units that are becoming available through all the uh, programs that you identify. And it's important that people, um, although we may use a lottery, that there is an element of fairness to that people are aware of the opportunities that they can be put forward for. And it's easier to find out about what those opportunities in the city of Toronto are. Okay. Um, I've uh, researched quite a bit on the uh, New York model. And um, I find it, you know, quite interesting that, you know, they have different incomes um, and depending on your income, you're able to access different units and therefore you can put your name forward. 
Um, it, is that what we're looking in here? Because the, the, we're going to have different levels of affordability. So some, you know, you, we might be talking about a family that makes seventy thousand, and you know, a single mother that makes forty thousand. They'll have access to different units. But again, there's there's central access point where you can go and see all these units and what you're eligible for. Um. Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor, that is correct. That's what we're hoping to do, so that people not it's a one portal access for the RGI system and the affordable, and even within the affordable system, there are different types of units that are available, and that the system will have people navigate that and put themselves forward the most appropriate unit, the unit that they choose for themselves. Um, and that could be the characteristics of that could include the rent charged, it could include the number of bedrooms, location, et cetera. There are many, many, many factors that drive people's choice. Um, about the units they want to put themselves forward for. And you're going to be looking for technology that is going to respond to the priorities that we've already set as council because our housing plan, for example, has priorities on women, indigenous, BIPOC. We have partners that deliver specific units for specific populations. So you're looking for a technology, technology that can also address that, correct? Um, yes, Deputy Mayor, that's correct. Thank you. Those are my questions. Uh, speakers on the item, Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and I, I'll just uh, politely remind you, if people could turn off their mics, I see yours, I see Councillor Fletcher's, and that's why people are getting the feedback, and my voice is bad enough as it is. Uh, um, Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair, I, I really hope that this does not uh, uh, proceed without a little more work and a little more understanding. I think councillors really need to understand what's happening. And I'm really sorry. Uh, this is one of the, as you know, I, I pushed to get my, my uh, residents to, to uh, uh, attend consultations. This one we, we didn't hear about. And so we didn't send our folks and I didn't send a team member to this consultation. I don't know when it happened. But here's the thing, <clears throat> we're setting up um, something vague and wonderful that will tell people about all the affordable housing opportunities and at the end of the day it'll be a lottery no matter what we're setting up here at the end of the day all we're doing is making it it um, a little bit better for people to know when there is a lottery we actually have that now you can go on the website and you can put your email address in and they will let you know um, I know that because my daughter enters every damn one. And if the units that come up are in a popular neighborhood or it's an attractive uh, development, um, 2,500 people may apply for 12 units. And you could be a uh, draw number. Painfully, they tell you which number you were in the lottery and why you didn't get the unit. You didn't. You were 691. You're not. <clears throat> So you apply to the next lottery, and uh, maybe fewer people are looking to get into that neighborhood. Maybe it's a little further out there in the east or west, and, and so there are only 300 people applying. And you get all excited because this time they, you get a notification back, the lottery is completed, and, and you were number 60. You're not getting any further up the list because the next lottery you may be applying in a popular neighborhood for the same family unit. Oops, uh, people applied for this one, and you were drawn number 1,762. And that's how we're allotting units right now. What I do hear, um, hear that is welcome news is that we're starting to realize that along with having new units coming on screen, there's a new and burgeoning problem that sometimes people's circumstances change, and they might move out of those units. They, they might even pass on. And and one unit is available. And, and we're starting to contemplate that over time, we're gonna to have to start to keep track of those. If it's been deemed to be that unit for 50 years, how does the one of get allotted? It looks like there's a lot of thought going into that and a lot more tracking. But at the end of the day, I'm shocked and dismayed that people just want to continue to roll the dice. And it makes it hard for me to uh, to to understand without watching those consultations that that was 100% clear to people. 
that you can't uh, you can't really if it's if it's average market rent or eighty percent of average market rent, which is a very frequent under inclusionary zone. That'll be a frequently constructed unit. It's it's really not how you would say, and this is a culture development, and the lottery will just be for people who qualify for culture or it's an LGBTQ complex or, or whatever. Um, it's not clear to me how it will be fair to create those. How can we hive off a segment of the population and say to everyone else who simply doesn't disclose, identify that they have something uh, unique about them, they're just throwing their, their, uh, their chips where they may through the lottery. I'll tell you one thing. If that's the way we're going to continue, then those people, they have way better odds if they just spend $100 and enter the Princess Margaret lottery. Um, there's a three-bedroom townhouse in Council Bradford's ward coming up in the spring lottery, and there'll be better odds at getting it if you just enter the Princess Margaret lottery because that's a pretty popular neighborhood. And I expect since it will be free to get on this list, a lot of people will apply for that list who are earning that mid-range income that very much qualifies them for AMR or 80% of AMR. I hope this one will take a little more work in consulting. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just give me one second, because I just lost my screen. Okay, let me look at that one. Um, Councillors to speak? I'd like to speak. Okay, Councillor Fletcher, go ahead. Uh, I think it, and, and I, this is a very complex issue, and I think we all have calls from people saying, I've been on the waiting list for 10 years. When's my turn? Um, or I got sent out to three places, and none of them were the ones I wanted. It's very complex in the RGI list. And what we've just done now is we're consolidating all of this under the housing secretary, which is a welcome move and looking for two streams. But I think that this is part of your consultation, if I can say that to Ms. Bond and her team. You may have gone out, but um, I do think that there's a lot of wisdom in those of us who deal with people every day around these systems that what we've noticed in other um, current, I guess, lotteries, how those have worked, and what I don't want to do is get, uh, I'm, I'd actually like this to come back next month, uh, Chair. I'll move that. I'm going to move to have this come back again as a placeholder while we get to June. Uh, Councillor, I, I don't think, I don't think there's helpful. enough time for staff to do the work. Um, and oh, I just connect want by to next have month. the same conversation. Well, I guess we better set up, somehow we better set up a... Uh, a workshop of some kind because what I'm concerned about is that we'll get something very baked and I think you're hearing that there's a lot of questions perhaps concern with the recipe and I would not want um, wow something going on up there and there is Madam I would Mary, not want that to, to happen pardon I'm sorry, I'm just reminding people, they have to turn their mics off or the feedback comes. It's really got to do with the cascading screen at the top left-hand corner, that's all. Um, anyway, just to go back, my concern is that we'll get to, this is a report to committee, it's not going to council. I would assume June would go back to council. I don't know the best way Madam, to uh, really get in for Councillor Fletcher, let me suggest this. Um, if if staff can commit can I, can us, can somebody deal with that cascading picture on? They're the, they're trying, Councillor. The city hall one. Uh, can, the staff is trying to to work it out here. Um, Thank you. I, my suggestion is that if staff commits to um, meet with all the members of the committee, there's lots of questions and feedback that wants to be given, and I'll actually send out information to all members of council if they wanna have a briefing on this and further uh, information and discussion on this. So that, that is my suggestion, that with the members of council, they go around, and members of the committee, to ensure that there's a briefing and there's opportunity for you to share 
all of you to share some of these concerns, suggestions with, uh, with the team. Well, one of the ways that we've done that on the waterfront in the past is by having central workshops, making sure that there aren't um, 14 people coming to one because now we're doing committee business rather than individual ones. And that's the model I would like to work with, that those would be scheduled for all members of council who'd like to come. I don't want to get to June and turn this down or refer it somewhere else. And I'm sure that I'm sure that staff feel like that too, but I can tell you that's the direction that I would go in at this moment because I just don't feel that um, I need to have more information. We need to look at other cities, what they're doing, what's the best. And our RGI experience going from people on a wait list for 30% to people just walking in and putting their name on when someone's had their name in multiple lotteries and not gone anywhere. I don't think that's fair either. So that's a pretty strong message today, I think, from councillors on this committee. Not going to work. And I'm um, happy to have that conversation with you, Chair, to figure out the best way to do that. But I'm not, uh, I think it's ineffective to have 25 different meetings. We found it very effective when we're doing Portland's development. We have a lot of controversy to get in, make sure that we ask all those questions to some synthesis and I would have to say to our staff that please put yourselves in too deeply because I can see that there's going to be some concern with this model. And that's what I'll say. I won't I could refer it to the next meeting. We could just come back to this very same report because I had more questions and couldn't get them answered. Councillors have more questions and couldn't get them answered. And the place to do our business is in the committee, so we can have a workshop, but we have to bring this back. I don't want to end up in June with this report and saying, well, we already talked to you. It's not going to happen. I'm just so clear on that, Chair. So how would you like to proceed? Uh, Councillor Thois, we, we'll send this item down, and uh, over lunch we'll coordinate, and uh, we'll confirm with staff that either through sessions or consultation we can ensure that there's a... Uh, there's an opportunity for councillors to be consulted and to feed into this work. Is that okay? Uh, consulted and feed into this work, not simply, here's what we're doing. I have to be really clear on that, or we'll just bring it back to the next meeting and we can keep on this until June or longer. Okay, councillor. So we'll stand it down. We'll proceed to the next item. Thank you. Next item is 31.6, expanding housing options in... Uh, Oh, give me one second. I'm not sure if uh, the members of the committee, if they would like to speak now or if they prefer to speak after we come back from lunch. Can you just give me a nod? After lunch, okay, okay. So, um, expanding housing options in neighborhoods, uh, update report. Uh, we have a staff presentation. Um, Mr. Chief Planner, will you have enough time to do it before lunch? I believe so. It's 12.05. We should be good to go. I guess uh, okay. Deputy Mayor would attempt to get that in. Uh, I'd just like to uh, introduce a couple of folks who you are familiar with. Uh, Greg Ewins and Lillian D'Souza are going to walk you through uh, an update, a short update on where we are with the overall program. Thanks, Greg. If I can, oh, there we go. I can share my screen here. Good morning, everybody. Okay. In July of 2020, City Council directed staff to undertake a series of actions called Expanding Housing Options in Neighborhoods, or EHON. The intended study uh, intended to study, consult on, and recommend approaches to permit new forms of low-rise housing in the city neighborhoods. The report before you summarizes the progress on these initiatives, details consultation efforts to date, and raises some themes and questions that will be considered in our ongoing work program. Broadly speaking, the intent of EHON is to create a supportive regulatory framework for the construction of missing middle housing, shown here. Staff from across the city planning division and many other city divisions as well have been advancing and completing various initiatives in the council-approved EHON work plan engaging thousands and thousands of Toronto residents and stakeholders along the way. The 
The action items from the July 2020 work plan endorsed by Council are shown here. These are the core initiatives on which staff teams are directly engaged, shown on the left side of the screen here. As advised in a, a, so, uh, earlier this month, City Council approved garden suite permissions citywide. As advised in a November report to this committee, we are currently consulting on multiplex housing permissions and locally serving retail and service uses with the intent to bring reports on these matters to the committee before the election break. A city-owned site uh, has been through the city's real estate process and a consultant team has been retained to design a demonstration project as part of the Beaches in New York pilot program. In November 2021, this committee also received a report on neighborhood change trends connecting underlying zoning to demographic trends over time. And consultation on the Major Street Rezoning Initiative will commence this year with final report targeted for early 2023. As part of the core initiative, staff are considering how to resolve process, financial barriers, encourage low carbon development, and are engaged in our technical service engaged with our technical services staff to ascertain servicing capacity related to each of these initiatives uh, where applicable. We're also currently organizing a workshop on financial barriers and solutions with industry experts. The analysis of parking for missing middle housing was absorbed by the citywide review of parking requirements, which was approved by council in December 2021. In the case of Garden Suites, a detailed monitoring program was established, not unlike laneway suites, as part of the final report. Monitoring programs may be recommended for other EHA initiatives as well. Staff are also now in the process of developing a best practices slash how-to guide for Garden Suites and laneway suites, and this may be extended to other forms of missing middle housing in the future should Council uh, adopt uh, zoning changes to permit those. While some of the initiatives that have been put in front of council to date, uh, such as garden suites, require amendments to the official plan, it's anticipated that a more comprehensive set of amendments to the official plan's neighborhood policies will be considered and consulted on through this work program and reported on in 2023. At the center of our work is an inclusive engagement strategy being coordinated by my colleague, Lillian D'Souza, who I'll pass it over to now. Over to you, Lillian. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, if I can go to the next slide. So, um, so this slide demonstrates the different approaches we have used and will continue using through the initiative. We have to engage a range of stakeholders and communities, and we need a range of tools to help us with that. The strategy includes meetings with industry groups, engaging kids and youth, partnering with local universities, surveys, social media, and videos. We have also partnered with the Canadian Urban Institute to put together a round table of different types of expertise, both technical and from lived experiences. All of these approaches give staff the flexibility they need to engage with a broad audience and at different scales. Next slide. So this is a quick summary of the engagement we've done so far. Most of the engagement has been virtual, uh, which has allowed us to expand the conversation to beyond those who usually participate in our community meetings. In December, we wrapped up the multiplex survey, which received over 7,700 responses. About 80% of respondents supported multiplexes being built in any neighborhood across the city. We've also been engaging on garden suites since the spring of 2021. In the fall of 2021, we engaged on the draft rules and the permissions through an explainer video that we posted on YouTube uh, that has been viewed close to 6,000 times, and we received over 270 responses back through an online comment form and additional responses through email. We also have an e-update list, and you can sign up for this on our project website, www.toronto.ca forward slash ehan. We send updates on project milestones and engagement events. We've also been trying to streamline engagement events as much as we can, so we are not adding to engagement fatigue. So for example, we've collaborated and participated in events held by our colleagues working on the official plan review of Land Toronto, and we've also attended meetings organized by residents associations and grassroots uh, uh, neighborhood groups, um, so just trying to meet people where they're at already. This spring, we will be hosting a number of ward-based meetings and citywide meetings where we will be engaging um, on the expanded permissions for multiplexes 
and local commercial uses and updates to the neighborhood policies in the official plan. Next slide. So this is a preview of the next two or three months as we look towards the spring. We will be ramping up engagement scouting locally at the ward level and then going citywide. We have a few ward meetings booked already and we are working on scheduling more with councillors. In March, we will be scaling up from the ward level and we'll be hosting meetings in the different parts of the city, Scarborough, North York, Tobacco York, and Toronto East York. We will be reaching out to the councillors' offices, offices to help us with outreach so that local residents, associations, and community groups are aware of the engagement events. Towards March and in early April, we will be hosting citywide meetings. In April, the Ehon Roundtable members will also be engaging their constituencies and communities, specifically equity-deserving communities, on behalf of the city. We are also working on videos, DIY engagement toolkits, and surveys, which will roll out over the next few months. So to sum up this slide, there will be lots of opportunities to engage, and we are more than happy to work with local councillors to customize the engagement approach for their work. With that, I'll turn it back to Craig. Julia? The intended outcome of expanding housing options is to support the creation of housing that largely reflects the scale of what exists in many communities across Toronto, but adds much more variety in terms of unit size and type. Each of the buildings forms shown here is implicated in one or more of the expanding housing options initiatives. The orange structures, laneway suites, are permitted across the city, and Council recently adopted amendments to allow garden suites, shown in blue, across the city. Multiplex housing, shown in purple, and local retail. Commercial uses, shown in yellow. Both new construction and conversion of existing structures are being consulted on and reported on later this year. Opportunities for more dense multi-unit housing, shown in red, exist on neighborhood major streets. The city's policies already contemplate more density in these areas compared to the interior of neighborhoods. By gradually incorporating all of these different housing types into the city's neighborhoods, we can get a lot more variety in the housing that can better serve our communities across a greater spectrum of ages, incomes, abilities, and household compositions. This is the primary objective of the EHON work plan. As part of our work to date on missing middle housing, several questions have been raised that we, consider, we will consider going forward. The report before you details these questions regarding the official plan, including how can our neighborhood policies better accommodate the needs of a growing city in a manner that addresses inequities experienced by Torontonians and newcomers? Should we continue to use policy terms such as character, fit, prevailing, stability uh, in considering the city's sustainability, access, and equity goals? Has the policy emphasis on physical attributes and building types limited healthy and growth, healthy change uh, and growth in neighborhoods? These questions ask how we can reprioritize the policies and objectives of the plan to create more walkable, sustainable, dynamic communities. These are questions that have to be asked as part of our consultation and answered in any proposed official plan amendments. The report also raises questions about the appropriateness of things such as form-based zoning uh, as opposed to the current density-driven approach in low-rise areas. Uh, it discusses work we're engaged in related to the city's tree canopy and exploring affordability incentives. And while outside the scope of the EHON work plan, the report also suggests land division and permissions for walk-up apartments in areas beyond major streets as being worth considering in addressing the need to grow missing middle housing supply in the city. Going forward, we'll consult and report on, uh, with recommendations on multiplex housing, local commercial and retail initiatives before the end of this term. We'll continue to consult with stakeholders across the city, including on our roundtable on uh, these and other initiatives. We'll prepare helpful materials to educate and guide the public in pursuing missing middle housing. In 2023, we'll report on further EHON initiatives, including the major street rezoning work and general amendments to the neighborhood policies of the plan. Just a thank you to the many staff who have and continue to contribute their time, insight, and expertise to this work, and thank you to the committee. Thank you. Uh, we'll now proceed to speakers. We'll do one speaker before lunch. We'll break after the first speaker and, uh, and then continue after lunch with speakers. So first, uh, we have Christine Mercado. Good, af good afternoon, Christine. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christine Mercado, and I'm the chair of the Long Branch Neighborhood Association. And we would ask that this committee not endorse um, this report as a basis for ongoing public consultation. Uh, the LBNA strongly supports the acknowledgement in this report that city planning and growing uh, the city needs to have a multi-dimensional lens 
However, the removal of regulation and permissions on small scale development without any criteria for mandating affordable housing will only create more expensive housing in our neighborhoods at the expense of our tree canopy, plantful space, and neighborhood character. There are three requests that we submit to the members of this committee. Uh, we want this, we would request that this report be revised using the current 2021 census data, uh, which was just released this week. Uh, this report has been done on, uh, on a collection of the 2016 data, which was collected in 2015. Look at expanding, uh, is correction, uh, look at EHON options on an as needed basis. As the 2021 data census shows, um, growth is unequal across the city, and the one size fits all fails to acknowledge areas where the city's current growth plan is working. Uh, we need to look at these areas and replicate the learnings in flat or no growth neighborhoods. We need to dramatically increase and expand public consultations and engage those who live in areas being targeted for change. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, public consultation with those who are most impacted, and a meaningful consultation needs to be done uh, that is geared to be impacted uh, to neighborhoods at a local level. For example, we did a garden suites uh, seminar um, where we rounded up 100 people in, uh, in three days to actually attend a seminar because they quite simply didn't know what a garden suite was. Um, the uh, numbers outlined in the report to community engagement to date is low to us in a city of 2.8 million. And then those of us who are aware and have raised our concerns have been largely ignored um, or if we do speak up, we're called NIMBYs or anti-development or anti-change. And this is the furthest from the truth. Long Branch has increased by 13.3% versus the whole city. And we have 540 new homes because of our growth, our specific growth plan that's supported by the community. Um, we've been asking for development regeneration of our avenue. And there appears to be nothing in the EHON initiatives to accelerate that. Chapter one of the OP outlines specifics of a successful Toronto involves everybody at the table. And that includes grassroots organizations such as ours, which is, has pretty much been locked out. And our, the growth plan right now, we've actually had our success story using terms like density, prevailing character and stable neighborhoods. Neighborhood analysis is critical to developing successful strategies. So we've looked at our own data and using our own neighborhood as an example, there are 14 single detached new homes approved that have yet been even broken ground. And some of this uh, approvals have been more than six years. And this is the act of severing to create single family dwellings. In our RM zones that permit multiplexes, we have 32 opportunities to create multiplexes that have been wrecked because the property has been severed and it's just been the creation of single family dwellings. And these are in our RM zones, which, um, which permit multiplex housing. So clearly zoning permissions are clearly not the issues in, prepare, in preventing multiplexes in a neighborhood. The LBNA board members have been attending information centers and recently we went out uh, to the TDSB for wards two and three. And there are no new plans for new schools in Long Branch. So right now our in-demand school programs are at or over capacity. And so it's a big question on where all these density is going to actually end up schooling their kids. It doesn't speak to any kind of strategic coordination to direct growth to areas with under-enrolled schools or declining population, but instead enables investors and land speculators to dictate where growth goes. Our tree canopy is critical component to the green infrastructure. 87% of our tree canopy in Long Branch is on private land. EHON initiatives put this at risk while generating no new affordable housing. Where are the measurable goals for EHON? What, what are the growth targets for a neighborhood? Where is the scorecard that, um, from the city that speaks to and commends communities that are actually achieving what is desired and puts in place community level planning versus trying to fit a one size fits all approach? The LNA recognizes that growth is necessary for the city of Toronto. And where EHON is being planned, needs to be a corresponding plan for additional infrastructure for neighborhoods. Our growing population needs schools, it needs roads, improved transit, recreational facilities, and also more green infrastructure and trees. So we respectfully request that this uh, report be looked at through the 2021 lens uh, and uh, the census data be, um, be included. 
Thank, Thank you, you, Christina. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thanks for joining us today. We'll break for lunch and we'll back, be back at 1.30. Thank you, committee.
go ahead uh, go ahead and uh, met council yes so um i'm sure committee met uh, members will remember that this um was approved by the committee last spring and uh, approved by council in june we asked the province to issue an nzo uh, as we had with um, all other similar projects with all of the other uh, sites they did issue one um, and with this one um, they have not and there has been um, I guess radio silence as to why um, after with this much time going by and uh, the units are stored in a TPC parking lot so we have um, 59 out in the cold during this um, um, bitterly cold um, winter and when their housing is stored in a parking lot um, just because we Councilor have Killian, a give, us, give us a second, Councilor. Councilor Killian, give us Sorry. a second. It seems like we're having some technical difficulties. To Councilor Killian and, and to the Chair, it appears that our version on YouTube is not playing right, so you just need a moment to troubleshoot. Thank you. Let's pause committee proceedings for a few minutes. Madam Chair, you know in two minutes I'm, I'm going to have to step off for about 10 minutes. Okay, Councillor, um, I did speak with Councillor Scott, so we could use your name in a minute, so hopefully your name is still up. Thank you, Councillor. We can see and hear you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm really struggling with Linux today, so if, uh, if I drop off, uh, I'll try to come back on. Thank you. No problem. We can hear you just as if I am. Okay, sorry to hear that. This is a test, one, two, 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Without being on a stereo? Because I'm hearing myself as well. Sometimes I think the upgrades aren't actually upgrades. They downgrade the system when they put those in. Exactly. Same with Apple. And sometimes you get a bad system when they say they've upgraded. I think that happened with WebEx for sure. Can I say a few words? Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> one, two, three, one, two, three. We can hear you. We can hear you. Good, yeah. We're just testing YouTube too. That was the challenge. It was not going on YouTube. We're good? Okay. Councillor Fillion, if you can start over. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, last June, Council uh, approved the supportive housing project at 175 Cummer Avenue, and we asked the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs to issue an MZO. Um, and um, that has not happened after all these months and um, we're not getting any answer on when or if that is coming uh, even though um, they have been approved at similar sites uh, across the city so um, we are left with little choice but to go ahead uh, with the rezoning process um, but you know that is far from ideal and um, um, we know that if the MZO was approved now, the units which are currently stored in a TTC lot um, close to where they would be assembled and 59 people would be moving in. We know if we got the MZO, we could have those uh, in place and people could be moving into new homes by the summer if we, go the uh, rezoning route, which we're being kind of forced to do, um, there will likely be an appeal and, um, you know, even next uh, winter is very iffy for getting uh, homes for the 59 people who are currently without them. So, um, you know, we're, we, we need to start down this road, but still need to keep asking the province to approve the MZO just so that uh, we don't continue to have those units in storage instead of housing people in need. Thank you, Councillor Fillion, and uh, thank you for all the work uh, that you've done on this, and thank you for your community to come uh, down to City Hall today and join us at the press conference and for their continued support for this project. Thank you. Can we have a recorded vote? All those in favor of introducing, we don't need to vote for the introducing, but for the item, I would like to have a recorded vote. Introducing the item, all those in favor, that carries on the item, all those in favor. Uh, members of the Planning and Housing Committee, when I call your name, please indicate how you are voting. Um, Councillor Bailao. In favor. Councillor Fletcher. In favor. Councillor Bradford. In favor, with thanks to Councillor Fillion for all his hard work on this. Councillor Nanzietta. Uh, absent. Uh, Councillor uh, Perks. In favor. Councillor Perks. 
In favor. Councillor Bong Tam. In favor. Thank you. We have uh, another item to be introduced. Uh, it is uh, an item from Councillor Fletcher on the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, motion to introduce the item. All those in favor? That carries. Uh, do we need to hold the item down, Councillor, or uh, you, we're good to vote on the item? I'm, I'm happy to vote on the item. It's just to be a little okay. more proficient, professional. All, the, all those in favor of the item? That carries. Okay. So now we can continue with the uh, speakers on item 31.6. Uh, next, we have Jeff Patel. Good afternoon, Jeff. Jeff, can you hear me? I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, now we can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Annabelleo um, and members of the Planning and Housing Committee. Uh, Fontra supports the Expanding Housing Options in Neighborhoods program in principle. Uh, however, we recognize this is an extremely complex initiative, and um, we feel that right now the level of understanding across the city is extremely low. We believe that an extensive uh, public consultation process at a neighborhood level is critical. Citywide engagement is essential. There should be a review of the consultation process that's used for laneway and garden suites and learn the lessons uh, from those. Neighborhoods across the city have different characteristics that must be taken into consideration in expanding building types across the city. This cannot be a one-size-all initiative. The performance measures approach used by Garden Suites was a useful tool for dealing with different lot configurations, but the upcoming initiatives to introduce different building types on major streets and interior streets will require different considerations for different neighborhoods. Given concerns by many about the proposal to jettison the traditional measures of density, i.e. FSI, this proposal must be carefully considered and be subject to extensive public consultation. We are concerned about how the recommendations of the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force, um, if adopted, um, would impact on this program. As you know, that includes the elimination of public consultation. Um, the uh, Housing Affordability Report um, focuses on, on the supply side issues, um, which of course this initiative does as well, but it, unfortunately it fails to address demand side issues. In other words, the extensive land speculation uh, that is going on right now uh, and that was addressed in Councillor Cole's uh, um, motion that passed at City Council at the last meeting. Um, that, that motion appears to have fallen on deaf ears at Queen's Park. So um, we've um, listened with interest to the um, extensive um, issues raised by the Long Branch Community Association um, and think that these uh, were you know, many valid points made there and they should be addressed and reported back. We notice that, um, um, for example, growth, uh, as I said, the growth is unequal uh, across neighborhoods. You know, some, some are, are, are increasing rapidly of their own accord, and others, um, populations are declining, and actually we're not even using the latest data. And so how do we ensure that there's uh, growth right across the, you know, right across the neighborhoods, not just in and what's really happening is, is in the Young Corridor, where there's, there's extensive growth even now. Um, and some other, of course, some other areas along, along the lake, east and west. Uh, so finally, um, I, we noticed that the, the recommendation for this report is to endorse uh, the report. And we're wondering what, what exactly that means. Um, we normally either approve something or receive something. Um, what does endorse mean? Um, and, and in that regard, um, and this was raised with earlier meetings uh, this morning, 
is this report going to go to council or is it simply going to, in effect, sit there? Anyway, um, hopefully the councillors will will pick up on some of these issues and and raise those. Um, uh, this report is, as I said, is very complex and requires um, uh, quite extensive um, analysis and feedback. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, to comment. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thanks for joining us today. Next, we have Mark Richardson. Good afternoon, Mark. Can you hear me okay, counselors? I can't. I can't. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, there was a bit of an okay. echo, but we're back in business. Okay, there you go. Go ahead, Mark. Councillors, I'm a homeowner and a 28-year resident of the City of Toronto, and I strongly support the City moving forward quickly with the Expanding Housing Options in Neighbourhoods program. I would also congratulate the Committee on earlier passing PH 31-4, creating transitional and supportive housing opportunities at 1430 Gerard Street East, which is a site located about a six-minute walk from my house. As you have seen on both the laneway housing and the garden suite items that have been before the committee in the last few years, there will never be enough consultation to make some of the comfortably housed NIMBY groups in Toronto satisfied. Their comments today that we support this in principle, but is part of the long history of process that got us into this mess. The Federation of North Toronto Residents Associations, FONTRA, will never be happy about change. The Federation of South Toronto Residents Associations, FOSTRA, will never be happy about change. The Confederation of Residents and Ratepayers Associations of Toronto, CORA, will never be happy about change. The Long Branch Residents Association will never be happy about change. So let me say this clearly, as a white homeowner who is over 50, our city council cannot move our city forward and meaningfully deal with our current housing crisis via programs like expanding housing options in neighborhoods if the voices who demand priority attention in your city planning consultations are mostly the voices of white homeowners who are over the age of 50. We cannot move our city forward and meaningfully deal with our housing crisis if we fine tune our city planning processes to the preferences of the usual suspects of mostly retirees who show up and say no and go slow to almost every improved process that is before this committee. We cannot move our city forward and meaningfully deal with our housing crisis if you are not willing to upset incumbent homeowners in something the city in 2022 still strangely calls its stable neighborhoods. I'd encourage you to read the letter submitted on this item by the group More Neighbors Toronto. I did not write that letter, but I do support their volunteer work on supporting new housing in Toronto. I'd encourage you to read the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report that was released last week. It contains a strong roadmap on how the City of Toronto needs to refocus its planning processes. And I'd also encourage you to support the Expanding our Housing Options in Neighbourhoods program before you today. And finally, on all these new housing opportunities in the city, please, when in doubt, do more and go faster. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thanks, Mark, for joining us today. Next, we have Rocky Petrov. Rocky? Get a thumbs up if you can hear me. I just want to make sure I'm being heard. Good, thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. I know the item before you today is only here to receive an endorsement so that consultation on this item can continue along, so I'm going to keep my comments today really short. I think it's important that in light in the recent uh, report from the Ontario Affordable, <laughs> Affordable Housing Task Force from the Government of Ontario, that ability of our city to deliver on a project like EHON is going to be critical. The central recommendations of the provincial report, such as legalizing fourplexes as of right in our neighbourhoods, upzoning major avenues. This, these overlap very well with the policy recommendations that our city's planning staff are already developing as part of this process. So if we want to show that as a city, we are able to be trusted to deliver on the housing file without the need for provincial intervention, it is going to be imperative that we take action on this file and develop a made in Toronto approach to revitalizing our neighborhoods. While our city as a whole has grown, that growth, we all know it, it's been unequally distributed. Just Go to Young Street, downtown, waterfront, 
Young Street, these are growing at double digit rates, while these so-called established neighborhoods, they're stagnant, they're shrinking. It's placing unequal strain on our schools, transit and other infrastructure. It's also important that we really stick the landing on this item. It'll be the difference between getting the gold medal and returning home empty handed. We don't wanna follow in the footsteps of cities like Minneapolis that legalized triplexes, but because they failed to do any of the other changes to built form requirements, triplexes just weren't getting built. Nor do we wanna replicate our city's own R zoning where denser forms are permitted, yes, but because they're subject to more stringent requirements with things like setbacks, heights, and building depth, building is just impractical or impossible. Anyway, I digress. As a city, we've begun to undertake a process that will make reforms to our zoning regime that will enable us to build the type of housing that will be affordable, lowercase a, and meet the needs of the 21st century. Do not let the naysayers from various residents associations blow us off course. Expanding the housing options in our neighborhoods is essential to assuring that our neighborhoods do not develop into enclaves of wealth and privilege. Let's do the hard work necessary to ensure our neighborhoods Rain the vibrant, welcoming, and family oriented communities that we love. Full speed ahead. Okay, thank you, Rocky. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, that concludes the list of speakers for today. Uh, questions of staff? Uh, Any Madam Speaker, I'd have my camera off. Yes, Councillor Carroll, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions and, and I want to know, I, I'm very much in favor of this. I, I want people to know that I, I ask these questions more along the lines of, of really sort of flagging and preparing you for the questions that might come when this, when this goes further out into the field, because I'm, I'm experiencing sometimes the consultants are, are unprepared for the questions they're getting or, or are discomforted by them. And so the answers, the answers are, are not fully there, but in this report, I'm wondering if you could explain to me how we square the circle between these two things. There is, there is a, there is a section that talks about uh, the need to, to, to fill some of the multiplex and, and low rise forms of housing in along sort of local arteries and subdivisions where possible. And then the very next section, it seems that you've recognized there's a threat to retail here because you're talking about um, preserving or making room for them. How do we, how do we prepare ourselves for the fact that um, once we open up this new policy area, uh, developers may say, well, I'm going to buy myself a cheap flagging shopping plaza that's inside a subdivision and go for broke. And how do we comfort the community that in doing so, they're not going to do what, what they're doing out on transit avenues right now, which is whatever we've approved, they always apply for way more and we end up somewhere in the middle. If we really want the controlled neighborhood, low density densifying, how are we gonna get it without creating food deserts and without battling a lot of difficult variances? Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor Carroll, if I understand your question, correctly um you know the the uh the one aspect of local retail that we're trying to focus on in this report you raise a, a broad spectrum of issues related to local retail yeah uh, in the context of this report and the ehon initiative we're trying to focus on um really the small um historic role that walkable retail has played in neighborhoods so that if you um you know we're, it's that local living and working um ideal that we are trying to make sure is permitted by the, the the city's official plan and zoning framework uh again it's like providing the opportunity it's providing the option for that to take place and you you may have seen across the city especially in the, in, the, in the older parts of the city, that gradually these types of uses have disappeared. Um, I have seen that. Yeah, and, and certainly in the, in the post-war city where we planned for local retail, they too have gradually disappeared because the, the little plazas get bought up for townhouses and things like that. But they, That's right. They really are 
you know, thematically similar, but, but slightly different in, in terms of how to address them. And this report is focused on that um, permissiveness that we want in local areas where small mom and pop, small convenience store, dry cleaner, uh, coffee shop is, is, is a land use opportunity for people uh, in in a local walkable sense. Right, but but do uh, when we when they, we bring this forward, is this focused only on the downtown area, or are we creating? If we're creating a new uh, option in neighborhoods, it's citywide, and yes. where you have the local mom and pops, and I know people love them. Uh, you know, one of my most favorite places, a place in East York called Old School, which was the the, the bringing back of one of those shops and it's it's a great success. However, um, as soon as you get out into the suburbs, uh, instead of corner stores, it's the mini plazas. Around the corner from where I live in Councilman and Wong's ward, for instance, there's a shopping plaza for the supermarket size grocery store, albeit a, you know, a 60 size one, 35,000 square feet, not 100,000, um, and a row of, of stores, you know, the, the pickup retail. Right across the street from it, um, created right back mid block in the olden days, uh, a little bank of three story apartment buildings. So, if we do this, um, I would anticipate a developer would say, Who needs that grocery store? I want to apply because now we've got this. I've got three story low rise apartment buildings already in there under the new neighborhood zoning. I'm in like Flynn. How do we protect the grocery store when they're, they're, the planning act is silent on, on food retail? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it is. I'm not going to say it's, it's, it's easy. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is enable the land use through these changes. And we do need to look at all, uh, all situations, both the, the post-war city and the pre-war city, because there are different, as you point out, there are different ways that this manifests itself, as you point out in small plazas and, I really think we're trying to expand, literally expand the housing options, but also in this local retail component, make it more permissive than it is now. Right now, zoning often excludes even the possibility of a local retail uh, shop opening up, a local cafe. So we want to reintroduce that possibility with a view to um, enabling that, um, and, and, you know, I think in American cities and, and other cities, as the suburbs evolve and continue to evolve, uh, as walkability, as cycling uh, gets advanced in suburban contexts, uh, we want a land use structure that begins to restore and, and put back some of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the diversity of land use. We're, right. we're trying to move away from an auto-centric yeah. homogeneous land use pattern into something that is much more diverse, much more mixed, much more permissive uh, in terms of facilitating daily life for people. And, 100%, 100%. And better mobility, and better mobility choices. Yep. Yeah. That was your last question, Chris. Okay, Counselor. thank you, Madam Speaker. I, thank I did, you. I will, I will note, though, that I only got to ask two because I got some very long answers. Well, we'll continue. <laughs> we'll certainly that, that, be consulting. That's why I gave you, you a little... A little bit longer. Okay, Councillor Bradford. Thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks for this report. Uh, fantastic work here. Um, could you, uh, I, I want to focus on the Beaches East York missing middle pilot a little bit. Um, could you walk us through some of the rationale for uh, the proposal to re reduce the site plan control base fee by 50% on, on these types of projects? Uh, to the chair, sure, Councillor. I'll ask uh, Greg to uh, review that with us. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Uh, to the chair, um, Councillor, the the changes that we proposed to the site plan control bylaw uh, or the site plan uh, control fee were developed in uh, collaboration with uh, staff working on C2K and were a direct result of the observations that the Beaches East York pilot staff team made in their observations about how to approach missing middle development on. A variety of sites, um, specifically looking at a range of city owned properties to look at what development might make sense. As part of their work, in addition to delivering a pilot project, um, they've been asked to look at process, financial, zoning, and other barriers um, that you know, might prevent missing middle housing uh, in the current framework so we can look to respond to those 
where appropriate. So, but specifically, you're working with finance. The report talks about less of a heavy staff lift, less complexity in the applications, less circulation in the app applications. And and is this about right sizing a fee that reflects the level of work that would go into these things? That's a good way to say it, yes. Could you walk me through, uh, you, you've done a, a, a big consultation exercise, you've assembled a table of industry experts and community groups that have been able to weigh in on the missing middle pilot project, Beaches East York. What are some of the other lessons that we're learning through this process that will help us unlock some of these missing middle projects across the city going forward? What have you heard from industry that said, these have been the impediments historically, what have we learned and what are we laying out in the future? Right. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. I can. I can take this one. Sure. Okay. Um, no. I, again, like you know, um, like I said, some of the you know criteria in the zoning bylaw. I mean, a good example is um, the you know the the depth requirements uh, on a single detached building versus a, a multi-unit building being different. So converting existing housing to provide multiple units um, can create a situation where you have to go to the committee of adjustment for uh, variances. When you're ultimately making no changes to the exterior of a building, um, you know that's that's one such example. So that, that's an example of a process, um, you know, that we may be able to address through uh, changes to the regulations. Um, I mean, the other thing we've learned from the industry too is is the need for um, you know information to be out there. I think we've seen through laneway suites and what we're going to see through garden suites that there is an appetite for people to build this form of housing on their properties, and what is really valuable to them is you know, how-to guides, best practices, information, you know, that helps people understand what's possible and, and allows them to take the next step to look at actually creating this new housing. Okay, just cognizant of the time here. Uh, so you've hired an architect, cost consultant, sustainability uh, team for this project. What are the next steps in particular on the, on the pilot project? On the pilot project, uh, working with the consultants and staff, uh, not just in planning, but in other divisions uh, as well, um, Toronto Buildings, uh, the Environment and Energy Division, and so on, uh, and Create TO, looking at uh, putting together demonstration, uh, potential designs, um, looking at uh, how to how to create sustainability in the design, uh, looking at opportunities for affordability, looking at the financial feasibility of different construction uh, approaches and different designs on the site that has been selected and moved through the city process. Um, we'll also work to explore design solutions that um, work within the current regulatory requirements. So optimizing missile, missing middle projects, you know, in uh, on existing properties based on the current rules, developing a, a range of options and consulting on those. Uh, we also want to look at where the building code uh, may prevent um, challenges to creating certain forms of missing middle housing. So all of these things will be within the scope of what we look at with the consultants uh, and what we talk about in consultation. Okay, I'm going to ask two questions and then allow you the time to answer. Uh, page nine, amending the official plan you say that this work includes revisiting policies regarding prevailing building types and neighborhood character uh, and considering more permissive approaches. Historically, why has that been a challenge for us to unlock gentle density and new types of housing in our na neighborhoods? And, and so why do you need to do it? What have the challenges been? Why do you need to do it? Second part, the dynamic in planning meetings, I have known noticed from my own observations in planning meetings, uh, but also consultation that's going on, seems to be shifting uh, versus some of the historic consistent commentary that we get around these subjects versus some of the commentary that you've seen and heard today in the deputations. I think we had four deputations, at least two were, were vocal about the type of change we need to need to see to accelerate new housing options in our neighborhoods to support the type of work that's outlined in this report. Could you pr also provide some commentary on uh, if you as a planner and our staff are starting to hear a, a sort of um, changing voices or perspectives around the, the conversations that we typically have of development here in Toronto? Two questions over to you. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, your first one, uh, Councillor. The the uh, the notion of prevailing building type in the official plan dates back a number of years, and I would say you know the official plan tries to strike this balance between stable, the concept of stable neighborhoods, neighborhoods that don't change very much, 
uh, versus recognition that neighborhoods actually do change and evolve. And and we've seen that over the you know many many decades in in Toronto's recent history, uh, and I think looking at words like prevailing allows us and having a good conversation about it allows us to recognize more directly that that uh, neighborhoods do change, and they they the official plan actually says they're stable, not static. So the 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 tweak here, if you will, is understanding how limiting the official plan can be to gradual evolutionary change. Understanding, you know, the, the scale of neighborhoods overall, likely four stories and and uh, the, the types of scale that you see to the built form, is not really what we're talking about. We're talking about the how the official plan can prevent that gradual evolution, just um, just in in the use of a few words in in policy. So we're looking and asking questions and having a conversation, an open conversation about that, um, with respect to. You know how how things are changing in the conversation. I um, I mean I, I I know the staff are almost out every night in, across the city hearing um, hearing about what's what's happening through virtual engagement and uh, the the dynamic to use your word is that that we're hearing a lot of interest around housing and and people who cannot find housing in the city or feeling or feeling that they're priced out of of housing. Can't, don't have the housing solutions, the housing options. Um, what we're doing with this program is not a panacea. It won't answer everyone's questions. Uh, changing the zoning bylaw will not magically make the housing appear. But uh, we're talking about enabling. Uh, we're talking about opening up options through this exercise that, uh, at least in part, will begin to uh, address some of that dynamic that we're hearing uh, across the city, which is is quite is quite quite vocal and we're getting a lot of voices that we have not heard before of people who are struggling to find a housing solution. Greg and Greg, thank thanks you. very much. Thank you, Councillor. Any other uh, councillors with questions of staff? Councillor Nunziata? Yes, I, I just have one question, uh, Greg. Um, page 14 of 19, partnering with local universities. Can you can you elaborate a bit on that? Because you mentioned Weston. Um, on the list, is that is that what we're working on in Mount Dennis? Is that what you're referring to? No, actually, uh, Councillor, through the chair, we're we're actually referring to the fact that many of our schools in in Toronto have urban studies programs, and and uh, for example, the U University of Toronto has a school of cities, and we are availing ourselves of that expertise um, at at the various um, secondary post secondary schools to help us. Do research to help us understand the issues to help help part, uh, for them to actually participate in the in the conversation. So it was, it was it was more a reference to the consultation that we're undertaking. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I want to just uh, ask staff the question regarding um, the provinces. The province has just released their summary around the affordable housing task force at the beginning of this month. Um, and I want to just understand, does that housing plan have any, or that set of housing recommendations have any uh, impact or will it affect the work that you want to do? Because it was so wide ranging with 55 recommendations, the waiving of development fees and, you know, there's a whole bunch of things in there that we, we still need to understand. Um, how does that impact your work in this report? Uh, through the chair, as you point out, uh, Councillor, there are 55 recommendations. Many of them um, uh, relate to a, a broad range of municipal tools, whether they be charges, uh, consultation, uh, municipal finance policy, um, and so on and so forth. There are a series of recommendations in there that very much align with the path that we are already on in Toronto around expanding housing options. Um, so, in some respects, there is uh, there's a there's a concordance there, uh, but that report is a report of a task force. It is not provincial policy. It is not legislation yet, and I do not know how much the province is going to, you know, take from that report and turn into turn into draft regulation or draft legislation. We'll likely see some announcements about that in the coming weeks, and and uh, and and continue to consider uh, what they're advancing. In the in the amount of time they have left before the provincial election. 
Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. So it's it's still it's something you have an eye your eye on, although you don't know what is real and what's fiction. What will be material? What will be implemented as legislation passed with regulations and versus what's a what's a wish list for them? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and that's very helpful because I was trying to understand how do the two uh, mash up. Um, so I guess the the other question I have for you is, you know, obviously we want to see the expansion of, of housing options, but I'm not seeing a lot of um, talk in the report about two things and two things I care very deeply about. We all do uh, affordability. Right and beyond the supply and demand side, because that's that's too simple. Um, but uh, but how do we guarantee or at least drive in affordability and also um, accessibility? Um, oftentimes these smaller sort of infill projects don't necessarily um, contain accessibility universally uh, inclusive design features. So therefore someone using a wheelchair, a walker, um, the opportunity for age in place. Um, how do you how do you address that issue? Because we're going to be building a lot more housing, which is good, but I'm not seeing a lot more um, fully accessible housing being built in the city uh, anywhere, to be quite honest. And how do we change that? So through the speaker, I mean, you're quite right, Councillor. This is not an affordable housing program. This is market market housing. The the EHAN approach overall is is um, is trying to get at different options for market housing. However, there is to the laneway suite program and the garden suite program and attachment to the city's existing affordable housing um, uh, uh, pilot for eligible property owners. And I, I, I would anticipate that we will continue to work with the housing secretariat and others on infusing uh, you know, an affordable housing stream in, in uh, EHAN initiatives. We're certainly looking at affordability in the East York pilot and testing how we can make um, uh, bake in, if you will, affordable uh, affordability, accessibility as well, um, testing and, and promoting accessibility. Um, you know, you have the building code, which mandates accessibility to some extent. And I, I take your point that we want to go you know, beyond that, facilitate intergenerational living, for example, and, um, and, and housing options that work for people of all means. Uh, so it, it's something that we're very much aware of and, and can model through guidelines, through uh, uh, advocacy to changes in the building code, and through zoning. We, we recently improved the, the laneway suites bylaw to, to actually specifically address accessibility concerns. So it's, it's very much one of our core principles in EHAN is understanding how we can promote and where possible uh, regulate uh, accessibility. And do you anticipate that as you drive to a final report and an outcome after consultation and some technical review, that you're going to build greater accessibility in all the EHAN options and, of course, try to drive forward towards greater affordability, albeit much more limited in the EHAN program? I, I just don't want to miss these opportunities as we see new housing. Because I, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is that folks are, are saying it's great that you're building housing, but it's still it's still unaffordable. It's still inaccessible. So we need to just sort of shift that. And I wanted to know how we could shift that through through EHON or perhaps, um, you know, even leveraging some of the good things that are the affordable housing um, report from the, the province. Uh, that's my final question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor. I mean, it's. It, I'll, I'll just say that it's, these are core principles of the EHON initiative, and in any way we can, um, either promoting affordability. Um, um, Aspects through through support working with the, the housing secretariat and through modeling uh, best practices through uh, the, the uh, East York pilot uh, testing accessibility and affordability parameters as well as uh, uh, climate friendly uh, construction. These are all you know very much part of what we want to model through through all of this as um, and promote if you will. As people uh, begin to pick up these ha these housing options in the in the zoning bylaw changes that we ultimately bring forward to council. Thank you. Question, Fletcher. Thank you very much. Well, I thought that was all uh, at Ward 19, not just in East York, Mr. Chief Planner. Could you clarify, please? Um, sorry, Councillor. I'm I'm. 
maybe I've, I've confused an answer. Sorry. You, you called it the East York pilot and I'm asking, I thought it was throughout the whole ward, not oh. just in East York. Yes, it's it's Toronto East York. It's a it's a it's a beaches East York, I believe, is Ward 19. Be I misspoke. Yes, because somehow Google says East York goes all the way to the lake. So I'll just ask you to make sure that you I, I can't correct Google, but I can ask you to use fair, the fair enough. I, fair Thank enough. you. Um, I don't know, and I'll just ask about this because I have a tremendous number of what we'll call missing middle housing in my ward already. Many, many conversions or building multiple units in different places. And I don't know if you have already, if you have an inventory of those, and if not, why not across the city? Well, uh, through the chair, we we have, we have certainly can collect ward profile, ward profile statistics from Statistics Canada on what exists in terms of building forms throughout uh, different parts of the geography of the city. The zoning is, as you point out, more permissive in your ward as it is in uh, some of the older parts of the city. And over time, we've seen these various uh, housing types get constructed, as you as you probably know. Um, but we, we, you know, a lot of this happens as of right, uh, which is, I think beneficial, and it's ultimately picked up in the statistics that are collected through um, through the the census. One thing that we're very interested in is uh, learning from uh, building permits that get issued. We've done some research on uh, missing middle building permits that have been collect, uh, issued over a number of years, and I think it's something that we need to continue to turn our attention to as we go forward with this because we'll want to mon monitor performance of these regulatory changes to see what we're getting from all of this effort. So it's something so that we'll be about, turning sorry. our attention to. Uh, do you have that list? I'd like to see that. I don't, I don't have a list. I, going? I don't it? have a list of what exists because it comes from the census. I, it's not no, I'm talking about the building permits that you spoke about just now. Uh, we can probably pull information on building permits uh, to collect aggregate data. It's not something that we've done recently. We did it as a research exercise a few years ago. Yeah, so, and then there's certain types, you know, I have apartment buildings right in the middle of a street. On, uh, on <clears throat> Gillard, there's one right there, fourplex, sixplex right there, there's lots. And I think it's important that we show also what exists. And yes. we're able to showcase, here it is, it's sitting in the middle of a street. Nobody's upset, it's been there for a while. And then here's an application for another one. Or here I have a lot on Dundas for single family. They've been built up on main streets at the corners, lots. So it's kind of like, I don't think we're reinventing the wheel, but I kind of get the feeling that we're trying to with so I really need to be able to show that, you know what, maybe we're tweaking the wheel, but we're not reinventing it. So how can you help me with that? Well, we'll, we'll take take back your observations about finding new sources for information, and and maybe we could develop a map or a uh, you know ward ward profile kind of basis of what does exist because you're quite right, it it is quite prominent in in many parts of the city. So we'll take that back and see what we can develop as we go forward with the consultation. Happy to do you not that. think that would be helpful in the consultation in the city uh, to show not there's not just a pilot. We're not starting something brand new, but this is a form of housing that's actually existed. It's fit in <coughs> very well with the rhythm of the neighborhood and it's multifamily, multi units. Um, the world didn't end at that point. And I think actual demonstrating examples that are older and fresher outside of saying we're starting something new is rather important. So I'm gonna ask you for that. Do I need to make a motion for that or will I get that back next time? No, I think Would you like a motion? Been, Pardon? I think we've already been doing it in the communications that we've been advancing and we don't need a motion. We'll continue to uh, use those examples and, and use new data to demonstrate that it already exists and that we're building on what already exists. 
So I am looking Thank for you. that information question, word by word. Thank you very much that it exists already because there's this feeling that we're starting something brand new. When we're we'll, be we'll be happy to uh, to build that out into our into what we publish. Thank you. Thank you. Any well, other I'm questions? looking for that be not before. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll Go speak to it. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions of staff? Seeing none, I have a couple very quick questions. Um, I just want to make sure that I got this right. We we did um, we have been in communication with all city councillors and have offered to conduct community consultations in their words. Is that correct? That's correct. We actually have an e new e update to councillors on this project. Correct. Uh, one went out, I believe, uh, last week, and we've done we we did one in the fall as well. We sent one out on February the seventh, I believe. Okay. Are our counselors starting to engage? Have we started to have community consultations on this issue? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. We've already set up several ward based meetings and we're in progress of setting up several ward based meetings with other counselors. Okay, great. We also have, as part of the round table, a very diverse group of organizations from across the city uh, that are not only advising you, but there's uh, the, the the ask to uh, do it yourself so that they go and with their organizations also have a diverse range of consultations. Is that correct? Yeah, maybe Lillian can just uh, describe that very generally, Lillian. Yes, thank, thank you for the question uh, to the chair, to you. Uh, yes, that is the plan going forward in April. Um, the roundtable members, once they have had uh, a few content sessions to build capacity within the table themselves, they will be going out to their own constituencies and communities and engaging on behalf of the city. Um, and they will also be uh, providing meeting supports like honor area and translation, translation services if requested. Okay. Um, I've also noticed a significant amount of media coverage and discussion in the media on this topic. I hope it's not me because I like the issue, and <laughs> but I really do think, are we doing like a media scan to make sure that we're actually understand the kind of discussions that are happening? Because I've seen major, all major newspapers, TV programs on this issue, uh, uh, events. I mean, like Councilor Bradford participated in one not too long ago. The discussions are happening across the city. Are we capturing that? Uh, yes, we are a counselor. In fact, we we post links on our uh, website to uh, to media reports. Uh, there's a lot of discussion online, of course, but there are are more um, or there are larger media pieces that are done on the topic, and we we try to do a roundup as regularly as we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Those were my questions. Speakers on the item, who wishes counselors to speak? Councillor Fletcher. Oh, sorry. Yep. Are you doing outside first? Councillor Carroll. Oh, thank you. Uh, the screen broke there for a minute. I'll leave my uh, video off because I think that'll make it work. Um, I asked my questions because I, I, I really feel strongly that if we're going to endorse today and, uh, and, and have the consultation go out that we've got to wrap our heads around being ready for what comes back to us. We know going out there that the opinions are gonna range. You, you heard the spectrum. You heard, uh, forget it. You heard, um, we agree with both sides. And then you heard, go, go like stink and get this done. And that's gonna happen out there. And what worries me is that people who will be asking for very, real things to be to be fleshed out for them. How will you deal with this? How will you deal with that? We'll get lumped into the two sides. I don't happen to believe that this conversation is as polarized as we think. I think there are people who don't want it. They have uh, single family dwelling neighborhoods that they never want touched. And we have those who are just desperate to see their kids and grandkids housed and they know that that really we can't do it all in 90 story towers on transit avenues. Um, but there are people in the middle who understand that change must come. They have valid questions. And I, I just want to implore staff to actually make sure 
that whoever they're sending out to do the consultations is is used to knowing when they're which sort of question they're getting right now because what they're going to be dealing with whomever they are the the consultation uh, guides or if they be a private consultant firm in some neighborhoods they'll be dealing with people who have been dealing with a lot of growth for a long time 20 years of going to planning meetings and working groups and seeing over and over and over again out on the avenues we set guidelines we make secondary plans and then developers always go over them and then we take out the butter knife and cut the model back 10 stories they've been through that process so many times that they will be nervous about this and they will have valid questions it doesn't mean that they they don't realize that change is coming uh, but it's going to be really important that we don't answer those types of questions with, here's what we're trying to do. Can't you see what we're trying to do? Yes, they do see what you're trying to do, but they still have valid questions. Am I going to end up creating a food desert, not creating mom and pop stores, but getting rid of mom and pop stores because developers see those lands as opportunities? Um, will I have a problem with this, that, or the other thing. Um, we're trying to calm this street down. Um, will I, if you put in this, uh, um, you put in this low density building on the central artery in our subdivision, will I suddenly be getting, the answer will be no when we're looking at, at traffic safety measures for the school that's further on down the block. These will be legitimate questions and they can't be dismissed as NIMBY every single time. Because if we're going to do this and we're really going to be able to achieve, then we do have to get it right. And there will be a large bank of community members out there that are asking those questions for that reason. That if there is going to be change in my subdivision, I just want you to get it right. And so I, I, my remarks are, are cautionary to staff. I think you should really be, if you are choosing someone to do this consultation, that's the filter with which you should be interviewing them, making sure they're able to tell when they're dealing with what they're dealing with. And lastly, in my last minute, uh, Madam Speaker, be it staff or be it a private consultant, we have got to start facing head on something that people are unused to in many neighborhoods in the city. They're hearing for the first time people who are do sound like Mr. Richardson sounded during the deputations. We just got to get this going. You have to get this going. And in particularly in suburban communities, when people view that with suspicion and say, who are those people? Did you pay for them to be here? You're going to answer that head on. No, that is a growing sentiment in this city. That is a resident just like you. And it needs to not be left hanging in the air so that it's always the politician who has to say it. We've got to be ready to face that head on, and it would be best coming from the neutral, trusted public center, the public civic staff. Thanks. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, members of the committee who wish to speak? Councillor Fletcher. Just a couple of observations. Uh, number one, Councillor Carroll, in, in my area, all the mom and pop stores are all going to cannabis stores, so they're not going to Missing Middle, and I'd say that's happening all across all across the city. Councillor Fletcher, can you hear us? I think we've lost connection. Okay, Councillor Bradford, go ahead. We'll come back to Councillor Fletcher. She, uh, did she come back? Or no? Okay, I, I will go. Um, that have happened. And somebody's oh. now got their, somebody has their. Uh, okay, go ahead. Councillor Fletcher, go ahead, continue. Thank you. So what I don't, uh, no, I don't necessarily think everybody needs a consultation, but now there's this pressure to, you know, have the missing middle. I want Mr. Lintern, I want to show what missing middle I have already. So my focus is affordable housing, and I wish we would have as long a conversation about affordability 
how much stock we need, how many units we need. Do we need this? How many big bedrooms do we need compared to one bedrooms? What size do we need? How are we going to get that? And how are we going to have people afford to live here? And for me, that's where our focus should be. And I'm not running this down in any way, but we've now spent an hour on a project um, that I can't actually hear, well, here's all your missing middle sites and here's all the building permits pulled for that. And here's this, and here's the ones that exist already all over your streets, because many of us have those. And I think it's easier for people to understand when they see those already there in their neighborhoods. Now, maybe some people don't have that. You know, we have had this, we're focusing on this. We have multi-tenanted buildings that we couldn't get through, um, which aren't missing middle, but they are, should be legal rooming houses and they're not. I just think that when we're going down new roads, we don't show enough that we already have some of those roads. It's easier for people to see, well, that worked out quite well. Well, that's okay. Well, that's fine there. Oh, that looks great. Oh, how many people are there? That's a great idea. It's very helpful. So I'm just going to reiterate that and I'm going to assume there's an undertaking from the chief planner to provide that information um, to me about my ward and anybody else who's asked for theirs. Thank you very much. Councilor Bradford. Thanks, Madam Chair, and I'd like to start with just offering some sincere thanks to uh, to our chief planner, Greg Lintern, Greg Ewins, Lillian, everybody who uh, has had their arms around this big body of work. Let's keep in mind, folks, this is this is just an update report of 19 distinct but related pieces of work that are underway that is informing our thinking around expanding housing opportunities in our neighborhoods. 19 discrete components that are working together to bring more housing options to more people in more neighborhoods. And that has never been more important than it is now. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to do on the housing file. This committee is where all of that action is taking place. All of us around the, uh, the proverbial horseshoe here and outside councillors who are participating today. Uh, we all have a shared interest. We all share values around the need for more housing. But housing is gonna come across the spectrum. A number of the items that we were dealing with here today were about the deeply affordable housing, subsidized housing, housing with supports, those programs uh, coming up, bringing that into the 21st century, how we deliver and administer those housing programs, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that and it's deeply, deeply important. Equally, also true, is the need for more market housing and the, the need for more market housing in neighborhoods. Uh, those are not separate things, there is a huge need and, and I keep coming back to the generational point. I think about my friends, my colleagues, folks entering the workforce who desperately want to make a life, want to make a career here in, in Toronto and they have good jobs. You know, they may make the median income here in the city of Toronto. They may make $69,000. That's a good income, but it's not a good income if you can't afford to live in the city of Toronto. And that is that is what is facing far too many people out there. Uh, frontline workers, young folks, new Canadians, people are coming here. And again, folks who have access to economic opportunity, but the housing opportunities have not kept pace. And so that is why, you know, I, I reject the notion that, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be accelerating market opportunities. We have to do that as well as all of the deeply affordable housing with supports, uh, expanding Toronto community housing, all of the different ways and multi-tenant housing, some of the most deeply affordable housing opportunities. We need to get that done. All of that stuff is important. So 19 pieces here on the market side in the neighborhoods, that is all good. I'm obviously very excited about the, the Beaches East York pilot because I think the lessons that we're learning there and we heard from, from the Greggs today as well, uh, that those are informing uh, our approaches really to get the framework right, to get a framework right that we can roll out and expand across the city of Toronto because we know fundamentally when you talk to people, whether it's the nonprofit sector or the private sector or even people who are on the, the city side, talk to folks delivering our Housing Now programs, there are challenges with our, with our development framework. 
and it is all related. And we go back to the concept of key stuff that we were talking about this morning. Uh, the system and the process uh, is not broken, but it needs to be refined. It needs to be optimized and it needs to be done so with the mindset of how do we build complete communities, but deliver housing affordably and expediently here in Toronto, because that's what we're all trying to get done. Uh, lastly, I will just say, you know, I really appreciate Council Car uh, Councillor Carroll's comments. Um, you know, they are well taken. It is so important, us as a government, us as a city, that we get it right. Um, and, you know, getting it right doesn't mean that it has to take longer, um, but it does mean that there's a lot of pressure on us as we make these quite historic changes. When we open up the official plan, when we challenge some of that language that has, you know, resulted in stagnation, static neighborhoods for so many years, we have to address that head on. We have to do it thoughtfully and we have to do it in the right way. I think her comments are bang on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are hearing from different voices. And that's actually why I asked that question of our chief planner. Councillor Carroll was alluding to the same thing. I know that Councillor Fletcher uh, hears those in her meetings as well. Um, there is a chorus of new voices who are participating in this the, these planning processes. And, you know, God bless them. I am glad that they are there. I'm glad that they are speaking up. But they're not plants. They're they're not paid folks who are you know attending a Fontra meeting in North Toronto. They are people who are standing up and speaking out for more housing options because they are generational voices. They are people who are new to the city and want to be here and want to have housing options. And and we should not be dismissing those voices. Just like we shouldn't be dismissing the voices of folks who are reticent of change. But when we point to the existing missing middle options, which exist in Toronto, Danforth and Beaches, East York and Davenport, uh, Annex, we can show that. We can show what it looks like. We can show how it built. We can build off of that success. We can optimize our systems and we can move it forward. And to, to the deputant's uh, uh, comments today, you know, it's a, it's a full speed ahead approach. We just have to make sure that we get it right. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thanks staff for all your hard work. I love to see it and uh, can't wait to see more in the days ahead. Thank you. Other members of the committee who wish to speak, Councilor Wong-Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you uh, to you uh, and to city staff for all your work on this. Um, I guess I'm going to come at this conversation slightly different, uh, largely because uh, as a downtown councillor, uh, we have seen tremendous growth and development intensification uh, just in every single little pocket of the downtown core. Uh, and I've spoken at great lengths about what happens along the avenues and along the growth centers. Um, and so when we talk about expanding housing options in neighborhoods, um, literally they're the only neighborhood, the only portions of the downtown that is stable and, and it's about to be a little bit less stable, um, especially when we factor in the major um, sort of transit areas uh, for upzoning. So I'm pretty mindful that this conversation is going to change the way we look um, in the downtown core for some time to come. Uh, areas that have seen some uh, some lows rise uh, uh, character communities uh, already they're quickly unraveling. Um, I can probably point to a number of them that are uh, sitting along the Young Corridor, um, along the Bay, the Jarvis, the, the Sherburne Corridor, that is already rapidly changing. Uh, we're seeing the assembly of uh, of entire blocks with 22 or 23 houses that are being assembled by developers and they're being put forward as sort of rezoning applications. So this conversation has to be, I think, put into a context that every area of the city is going to be a little bit different. Um, I, I wanna come back to one thing, and that is the province's task force. And, and, and to our chief planner, thank you very much for your answer. I know that you have an eye on what's happening there, um, but I do wanna flag um, a very important piece of, uh, of that report. And the report is basically sort of framed under this whole banner of YIMBY, uh, yes, in my backyard, let's do it faster, more, as much as possible, right? Um, and part of the, the Ontario, um, uh, I guess, uh, task force recommendation is to repeal and override municipal policies, zoning and plans that prioritize the preservation of any physical character of every neighborhood. Exempt from site plan control and public consultation, all projects that are 10 units or less, according to the official plan, and, and only um, properties that require minor variances. Uh, establish province-wide standards or prohibitions for minimum lots. Uh, maximum building setbacks, minimum heights, uh, angular planes, and so forth and so forth. Restore pre-2006 uh, pre uh, floor uh, site plan exclusions, uh, which means that you no longer get to the, the granular detail 
of how you want to build buildings that's going to enhance or perhaps um, you know further advance the public realm. Remove any floor plate restrictions to allow larger, more efficient, high density towers. So that's one piece of the conversation that's happening at the province. And then there's the work that we have to do, which I think is also, um, I, I hope, much more Toronto Taylor that's going to be, um, uh, you know, bringing forth that conversation that we wanted to do, but not necessarily with the sledgehammer. So I wanted to factor. I just wanted to put that into context for all of us is that while we're trying to have a conversation about what happens in neighborhoods, let's let's factor in the fact that uh, let's factor in some considerations that perhaps the downtown, which already sees more intensification than most of the city. I've approved probably more housing applications than than all the councillors here. Just no, no disrespect, just just given what's happening here. This is what we're living with. And then layer on top of that, this conversation that's happening in the province, whether it comes to fruition or not, I, I don't know, um, but I think we just need to be mindful of it. The other thing that the province is doing, I wanted just to flag this, is that they're talking about waiving all development charges, uh, all parkland cash, um, cash in lieu contribution, and only charge very modest quote unquote connection fees uh, for infill residential projects up to 10 units or for any a uh, new development where new material infrastructure will, will not be required. So they're going to take a big chunk out of the city's revenues on how to provide adequate resources to support the infill, to support the development. And at the same time, I'm just going to finish on this point. We are seeing community schools uh, where they're at capacity. We already recognize that there are some neighborhoods that are very parkland deficient. We have a long queue of lineup of uh, communities right across from Toronto that are looking for community services, recreation programs, community centers, and so forth. We cannot grow sustainable, livable, dynamic, and beautiful neighborhoods without taking a holistic approach. And that's what I wanted to, to, to bring to, to the point, is that while these conversations and policies advance, I think they're really important, but we just need to keep our eye on all the other moving parts. And I hope that we can do this. I know this committee is not going to be the only one that's got the carriage of it, uh, but it's something that we as councillors need to do when we get the city council and take a look at this sort of uh, entire approach on how to build beautiful, sustainable communities in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other councillors that would like to speak on the item? Nope, seeing none, I would like to just say a few uh, comments. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, thank you to Councillor Carroll for bringing that issue that I think there's a lot more in common with all of us around this issue than what we think. I don't believe that if we ask people in Toronto, if they believe that workers in our city should be able to live here, that anybody would say no. I don't believe that if we ask people in our city, if we want to have more and more excluded neighborhoods where, you know, only if you can afford a $1.5 million home, you're able to live in there. If that's the kind of city you want to build, they will say yes. I think that a vast majority of, this, of people in Toronto would agree as well that with the climate change that we are facing, that sprawl is not the way to grow our region, that we need to look at different ways to grow our lead, a region that, you know, just sprawling and going into farmland, that's not the, go, the way to grow our region. So I, I even think that a lot of people will say, you know what, I don't want, and I've said this at this committee so many times, a city of 80 story buildings and little houses, where's, where's that middle? So I think a lot of people will agree on that. So I hope that we go into this conversation about saying, okay, if we agree on all these principles, how do we start making these things happen and saying that some of them we have to do, not being dismissive of some of these concerns. I think that what the success of the way that we went about the laneway housing and the garden suites, I think it was very much around the issues that we heard what people were saying, some of the concerns that they had around the overlooking, around you know maintaining green space. And I think it is important that through this exercise, we also understand and respond to the concerns and anxieties that people might have. But I think this is, a, this is something that, that needs to happen because um, I, I very quickly just went over some of the numbers from the last census. Um, and uh, you know, my area lost over 2000 residents and I have a number, quite a bit of development, but this was an area that was 
extremely, uh, you know, blue collar, working class. Everybody had two, three units, and that is being completely gentrified because it's easier to do in our system a big house, get rid of two or three apartments than it is to come and maintain that. So that's the system that we have. That's why we need to understand through the enhancing housing options in some neighborhoods that are not allowed at all, but even in the neighborhoods that they are allowed, it is really hard sometimes to do that. It is easier to do a big house. And so th these are, this is about enhancing housing options to make sure that you know, we manage the change. The change is happening. Our city is changing. We are not able to have workers in our city. Toronto Board of Trade is, is going to cost the, the, uh, the uh, region $8 billion. We are losing children in our city. Our, city's having, our city has less children today So because our families can't, can't live in here. The other thing is if we look at where the growth happened, the growth happened in the major growth centers where all condo units are happening. And what kind of condo units are we having? 70% of those condo units are one bedroom apartment. Who's living in those? Do you think it's families? Do you think it's the working families? Do you think it's you know, a starting family, a professional, people that wanna come and live in here? They, 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 in order for them to continue to live in this city, they are having to look elsewhere. So this needs to be part of our housing solution and it is part of city building. And yes, affordable housing is, is extremely important. But I've said this as well over and over again. Part of the solution is governments need to invest in affordable housing. You know, the market is not going to build us the supportive housing, the, 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 the housing that we need with the nonprofits for that deeper affordability. But also, we shouldn't have to be spending finite money that we have in creating housing for, you know, working families. We, should, we have tools in our planning system that could allow us to grow and to ensure that families continue to live in our city. That is smart use of our resources. Some of them are financial resources. Other ones are other kinds of policies. And the way that our situation, that our housing continuum is right now, we need to use different tools in, our parts, in different parts of the housing continuum. And right now, we also have an issue with this kind of housing, with the supply of housing that we're building, the kind of supply, and how we're building, and I would even say the kind of innovation, because the, with the kind of uh, cost increases that we're seeing in construction, we also need to start innovating in the way that we're constructing, in the way that we're building, and looking at these, what, what impacts the price of housing and how we can touch on all those points to make sure that there's a level of affordability that happens on market housing as well. And those are my comments, and with that, I move recommendation. All those in favor? And that carries. Okay, uh, we're gonna go back to item five, and Councillor Fletcher was speaking, and I believe we, uh, Councillor Fletcher spoke with staff, and we touched base, and we're all good on item five. So I'm gonna ask if there's any other members of of the committee that wish to speak on item five or if we can move to a vote. Can we move to a vote? Okay, all those in favor? That carry. Okay, where am I? Item seven, our plan Toronto, employment area conversion request, preliminary assessments, group two. Uh, we have one speaker on this item, um, three, okay. Oh, I only have one. You have to give me the other two. Okay. Um, uh, first, we have uh, Fred Fornet. Good afternoon, Fred. Thank you. Go ahead. You have five minutes. Good afternoon, councillors. My name is Fred Corneth, and I serve as the volunteer president of the Toronto Wholesale Pro Association, on, or called TWPA. TWPA represents the 22 whole, 21 wholesalers who have been working at the Ontario Food Terminal in Etobicoke since 1954. My family has been in the produce business since 1950. I'm speaking to you today because I represent a lot of people who are very concerned about the conversion requests made by the owners of 125 to Queensway. They're concerned about the potential impact of a major residential development going right 
next to the gates of Ontario Flu Terminal. <clears throat> the Toronto City Council has repeatedly support designating Ontario Flu Terminal as a provincially significant employment zone for a good reason. The terminal plays a large role allowing smaller business to compete against much larger or chain business. The terminal allows residents of Toronto to access a wide variety of fruit and vegetables within walking distance of where they live. The terminal is used for organizations such as Second Harvest and Daily Bread Food Bank, therefore playing an important role, an important role to food security and equity role. The terminal also employs a lot of people directly and indirectly. On any one day, around 5,000 employees work at the terminal, and the terminal indirectly employs tens to thousands more throughout the province. Many people whose walls work involves the Ontario Food Terminal work for the wholesalers of food processors in the agri-food network of business in Etobicoke surrounding the terminal. The lands surrounding the Ontario Food Terminal are just as significant to the employment as the lands on which the terminal is located. A major residential development right next to the entrance of the terminal would harm the operational environment for a nearby business at the Ontario Food Terminal and the viability of, of surrounding employment area. Pressures on traffic and technical complaints by residents and neighbors about the facility, for example, could harm the long-term sustainability of this essential employment lands. The Ontario Food Terminal relies on continued existence of employment lands surround the terminal for the use of purpose wholesales and other businesses supporting the terminal. The loss of employment land at 125 to Queensway would serve to put pressure on those other employment lands. Municipal conversion reviews are about balance and interests of employment lands and other uses. The city should reject the proposed conversion of 125 to Queensway into non-employment use because it does not strike an appropriate balance. We recognize the need for more housing in Toronto, but we also know that residents of Toronto need to work and eat too. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you so much. That, uh, next we have John uh, Denbauer. John Denbauer. Hello? John, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, we can, can hear, hear you. you now. Okay. Go ahead. You have five minutes. My name is John Agur, and I'm, first of all, I'm a farmer, <clears throat> and I also, I am the president of the Farmers Association in Toronto, and also I am a board member of that food terminal board. Um, I, uh, Fred uh, explained already in, in essence what the, the, the essence is for that place where we have that, but, um, uh, he he spoke for the uh, for the wholesalers, and I like to speak for the farmers. Uh, we we have only one place in Ontario where we can sell our produce, <clears throat> and that is the most important thing for independent stores, independent uh, restaurants, whatsoever. So. <clears throat> In that uh, token, I, I don't want to emphasize on, on, on the importance of the food terminal. Uh, we are blocked in with three sites. We have two sites. We have uh, sh stores, shops. One side, we have a highway. And one side, we have a high, uh, residential uh, low-rise uh, street. The problems that we have with, that, uh, with people there is that the noise. And... Um, when when you put a high rise of a very populated uh, area beside a building of a place where we where the main course of the business runs from 12 o'clock at night to 12 one o'clock in the afternoon with thousands of trucks going in and out so uh, please don't put uh, uh, that many residents how important housing is but don't put it beside a hot lab we have because that will lead to endless problems from noise and, and we as a board do everything we can do to make sure that we that we don't make make less noise as possible but it is it is an, 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 a no goer for us thank you very much thank you any questions of the speaker seeing none next we have bruce nicola bruce
Good afternoon, Bruce. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. You have five minutes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for letting us uh, speak. It's been a long time, over five hours. I mean, I've listed to what's been uh, uh, discussed at your meetings, and a couple of things pop up. The fellows, we had the wholesalers uh, speak, and we had John the farmer speak, and I think I'll speak overall for the terminal. I'm the GM and the secretary and the treasurer of the food terminal board who actually own the land and operate under the Ontario Food Terminal Act. We're a wholesale market. We have 5,000 buyers. We have about 100,000 people direct or indirect employed. We put out 2.1 billion pounds of produce a year. That's strictly out of the terminal. And as Freddie explained, this, the, the areas around with the second largest food uh, uh, food uh, district in North America, only Chicago uh, exceeds us. And in that district, there are all of the various wholesalers, jobbers, buyers, all the people that fed off of the terminal because the volume we have at this terminal can't be handled directly within. So sales made, and this is a key thing. I don't know if you guys know what the food terminal is, but the food terminal, to put it in simple terms, take the in Eaton Center, say everybody at Eaton Center sells shoes, and you've got all those people coming in every day, those thousands of people, and all they're doing is buying shoes in the one location, except with our location, all those people are coming in to buy fruits and vegetables and flower products to send back to the over 5,000 independent buyers all over this city, all over this province. We extend to Newfoundland, we go to Vancouver, we go to Northern Ontario and Alberta, and in based on what's going on with the American dollar, we take it to the states. 2.1 billion pounds means an awful lot of vehicles. We're probably just under a million vehicles go in and out of that terminal. And if you place a residential site next to us, you're gonna have noise issues, you're gonna have light issues, and we're gonna have security issues. It's a wholesale market. We have to ensure that the general public is not wandering around the marketplace when there's 75 foot tractor trailers, a couple 150 of them driving around a day in the dark, trying to back up and making sure nobody's there. What that means is we're gonna to have to put fences around the terminal if you put that property next door to us. We have helped the city by building a roadway at the Eastern end of our city that takes 10 tractor trailers off the Queensway onto our property before they actually enter within the confines of the terminal. That has helped the city. We won't be able to do that if you put residential next because I have to put tent fences at the gate to make sure the public does not get in. Why? Because I have to buy li liability insurance for the operation of that entire facility. And on this guarantee, they're gonna say, we have to make sure that we keep this thing only for the people that are allowed to come in. So there's gonna be huge impacts if you place something like that. Major terminal markets in, in Chicago, in New York, in Boston and Philly, don't have a residential neighborhood sitting on your doorstep. It just will not work. So if you, the City of Toronto, decides to agree to have residential over a food distribution system that maintains all those stores and all your neighborhoods you talked about, about the walkable retail and the mom and pop stores, those people buy at the Ontario Food Terminal. You choose retail over that distribution center you basically said that's the death knell of the terminal. It may not happen the first day, but within a few years, you're going to find out that the place has got to close. And that is the last thing you want to do when you I've heard all day long about neighborhoods, and good neighborhoods and, and retail, et cetera. That terminal provides the produce to have those stores on those streets. And it's extremely important to maintain it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, are there any questions of the speaker? Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, that concludes our list of speakers. Are there any questions of staff? Any questions of staff from members of the committee? Seeing none, any speakers on the item? Councillor Nunziata. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a motion that the staff has to put it on the screen. I've been working with the planning um, planning staff on the draft of this motion. I'm asking for deferral 
on uh, two of the sites that I have in my ward uh, to come back in March um, to the to the conversion request uh, report that would be coming forward on March 25th. Uh, the reason for that is I want an opportunity um, um, to have dialogue with the planning staff and as well as um, the, um, uh, the community, because I haven't had the opportunity to do that. And so I'm asking for deferral to the March, uh, March meeting. Okay, Councillor, are there, oh, I'm just getting my screen back. Um, Councillor Perks, if, do you have Councillor, do you have questions of, uh, on the motion or, oh boy. Give me one second, everyone. I just lost my screen. You guys are all spinning. <laughs> Give me one second. I don't know if you can hear me, but. We can hear you. Okay, that's good. At least you can hear me. I just can't see anybody. Okay. So if you can hear me, are there any other counselors that want to speak on the item? Sorry, I'm just trying to find the motion so that I can see the address. Oh, it's okay. uh, it's Writing Avenue and Symes Road. Hey, uh, uh, Madam Chair, do you mind if I just ask uh, Speaker Nunziata a couple of questions? Go ahead. So questions of the mover, Councillor Perks. So I just want to understand, um, because the, the sounds a bit blurry here. Sorry, did you say you haven't had a chance to meet with staff or have any any meetings at all on this? No, I, I was just briefed yesterday and I want an opportunity to speak to staff and to the community as well. So that's why I'm asking to defer to the March 24th meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions of the mover? Seeing none, uh, speakers, any other speakers? No, seeing none, okay, I can move the report and just with a couple of uh, comments, I do have uh, some um, properties in my ward in here um, and I'm um, very happy to see the work that staff is doing to protect some of these. Um, they're not big for employments, but there's a couple of them that are great uh, employment hub, uh, and in some of them in particular around the creative arts, a lot of spaces that we're losing and that are really important to maintain. Uh, so um, happy to, uh, to to support and to see that uh, that coming true. Um, and and some of them, some of the others that uh, staff are, are still having the conversations and making the due diligence, but very uh, pleased to see some of these being ruled out immediately because uh, I don't think it would be helpful for the community. With that, all those in favor of staff recommend, uh, sorry, uh, Council Nunziata's uh, motion, all those in favor, that carries. Um, item as amended, all those in favor, that carries. Okay, that brings us to the last item of the day, 95 St. Joseph Street Notice of Intention to Designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. We have speakers, and we'll start with Leslie Yeager. Leslie? you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can, Leslie. Okay, right ahead, you, you have much. five minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Leslie Yeager, and I am a resident at 1080 Bay Street. I appear today on behalf of a coalition of three condominium corporations that either abut or overlook the property at 95 St. Joseph, namely U Condos, which is at 1080 Bay, 65 St. Mary Street, a thousand bay immediately adjacent to 95 to the east and 62 wellesley immediately adjacent to 95 to the south between us these buildings have over 1600 condominium units i worked for developers for three decades and there is a proper place for development saint joseph street because of its unique cultural landscape History and panoply of famous architects is not the place for high rise development. It is a special place that deserves the heritage recommended protection uh, coming to you from the Toronto Preservation Board. Our coalition supports this heritage designation and we ask that you approve it today. 
Our neighborhood is under development pressure from several fronts. The Daniels Corporation proposes to demolish most of 95 and replace it with a 39 story tower with residential uses. Those uses are not currently permitted under the existing zoning in force. St. Michael's College has already started a discussion about redeveloping the Kelly Library, which is right next door to 95, uh, and uh, creating new facilities, including student housing. U of T has filed an amendment to the in-force secondary plan to redesignate the block between Bay, Wellesley, Queens Park Circle, and St. Joseph as the Bay Street Corridor Character Area, which translates into high-rise development. And in their report, U of T has already noted that 90 Wellesley uh, is a potential development site. So we already have three potential developments in one small block and the edge of the historic St. Michael's campus. We are fighting to preserve the character of our neighborhood, which is low rise institutional and heritage. And we thank the preservation board for the excellent and insightful analysis of the character of our neighborhood. We have a consistent and coherent cultural landscape as can be seen by the history of the lands along St. Joseph the building materials and typology on the street, and the work done by famous architects over decades to create the coherent heritage and by environment of the campus. St. Joseph Street is a gateway, not to high rise development, but from the high rise area on Bay Street toward the low rise heritage campus to the west. 95 St. Joseph Street is a critical piece of the environment of St. Joseph Street and the surrounding campus. After the initial designation goes through, the developer has signaled their intention to present an alterations report to the preservation board. And uh, there have been over 130 emails sent to the Toronto Preservation Board in support of a full designation. And the chairman of that meeting noted she had never seen so many emails in support of any application during her tenure on the board. So I ask you to pass this designation today. I understand that the alterations report will go to Toronto and East York Community Council. And I ask those of you present today who are on that council to remember what I have said today and remember the intense community interest, which includes a lot of emails and support from students at St. Michael's College and other parts of the university to keep this wonderful building preserved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Dara Bird. Hello. Good afternoon, Dara. You have five minutes. You may start. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm speaking today on behalf of a residence coalition that is strongly in favour of the heritage designation for the seminary at 95 St. Joseph Street. We value the creativity and importance of the architect Cormier, the architectural synergy of the seminary with its surroundings, and the depth of its historical connection to the St. Michael's University College campus. The seminary is an important part of the context of St. Joseph Street, which is a harmonious gateway and the last undeveloped street running east to west into Queen's Park. At their previous meeting, the Heritage Preservation Board unanimously adopted a staff report recommending heritage designation not just for the facade, but for the entirety of the seminary buildings. Community support was evident in 468 signatures to a petition and 133 supporting email submissions presented to the Preservation Board. 98% of the submissions supporting heritage designation also raised concerns about the lack of preservation with a current development proposal for the 39-storey tower at the site, and they feared that it would overwhelm the low-rise St. Joseph Street and St. Michael's campus. We appreciate that the Planning and Heritage Committee views matters with a wide lens. I think the reason that there's so much public concern over this development proposal 
is that it doesn't appropriately balance all the important factors, including green space and preserving one of Toronto's most unique cultural heritage landscapes. The developer has requested a site-specific exemption to nullify existing planning protections and recharacterize the street as Bay Street. This undermines the carefully considered tenets of both Toronto's official plan and the enforced Toronto, University of Toronto secondary plan. Worldwide, most cities preserve the locale of their grand legislative buildings and their great universities. This development proposal feels wrong for many reasons, and so heritage designation is important. The developer will be submitting a proposal to keep just the facade and to entomb the beautiful Cormier Chapel in the base of the building. The expert opinion submitted to this committee from the Canadian Centre for Architecture argues for much greater preservation. The development would shadow the Heritage St. Michael's campus, particularly during the spring and fall term times. The new Clover Hill Park, already enjoying sun only during the afternoons, would receive an additional two hours of shade. Architectural Conservancy Ontario put it well to the Heritage Board. The loss of these small scale quality buildings in our neighbourhoods erodes the very nature of what makes Toronto's neighbourhoods inviting and great places to explore. Finally, I wanted to amplify a couple of alumni voices that spoke to the Preservation Board. Mary Pat Keelty, a grad of 1958, said, Today, coming in from Bay Street, the natural setting, the space, the green, the historic buildings there unleashes a relaxation that no commercialism, no sun blocking height can replace. St. Joseph Street, this avenue to pass in universe, to rest your mind, to think, is free to all Torontonians, the student, the scholar, the homeless. Space and beauty for the freedom of thought must be preserved in your planning. Joanne Evans said, I have always been proud of Toronto since my days as a U of T student for maintaining the heritage elements of our campus and city. Many people I have spoken to about this tell me not to be naive that money trumps heritage and history in Toronto, just look around. Please prove them wrong. Once certain decisions are made, there is no going back. We urge you to approve this heritage designation and send it forward to council to approve and implement as soon as possible. We welcome opportunities for imaginative adaptation and repurposing of the seminary, and we hope that the heritage designation will prove meaningful. And all of those of you who are members of community council, we hope you will support this principle when the development application comes before you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Last speaker, Remo Agostino. Good afternoon, Remo. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of Planning and Housing Committee. My name is Remo Agostino, and I'm the Vice President of Development with the Daniels Corporation. I'm here today on behalf of Daniels and the Bazillion Fathers to offer brief remarks on the matter before you with respect to the proposed heritage designation of 95 St. Joseph Street. As you may be aware, 95 St. Joseph Street is subject to official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications to permit high density mixed use development. The lands are currently occupied by the Bazillion Fathers and has historically played the function as an administrative office and the home for the Bazillion Fathers, and also has been a home to a number of the Bazillion Fathers and housing has been provided for members of the Bazillion family specifically seniors. A number of years ago, the Bazillion Fathers determined that the building space at 95 St. Joseph's did not meet their needs going forward. The care seniors units in the building have been relocated to a purpose-built seniors building in Scarborough, and the building at 95 St. Joseph was now too large to serve the office administrative functions for the Bazillion Fathers. This led the Bazillion Fathers to seek out a developer that would work with them to redevelop the lands and has partnered with Daniels. In the beginning of this process, the Bazillion Fathers and Daniels set forth to create a plan that is sensitive to the heritage conservation, even though the site has not been designated. 
In addition, we wanted to ensure that any new mixed use development maintained institutional uses as is on the lands today. As such, institutional uses uh, have always been part of this development application, and we are partnering with a well respected seniors housing provider to propose a new seniors care residence as part of this mixed use development. We're actually doubling the size of the institutional nature of the site. With respect to the heritage conservation, we have worked with city staff and our heritage consultants to thoughtfully recognize the cultural heritage value of the building. This includes retaining the north facade along with appropriate returns to the building facade, removing the 1979-1980 uh, projecting fourth floor addition, sort of the modernist addition that's at the top of uh, the building, which was completed at the time to add some additional seniors units, and we're going to restore the original facade. We're preserving the ceremonial stair along the St. Joseph frontage and relocating a currently internalized and private chapel to a more visible and accessible location within the proposed mixed use development. In addition to that, we've worked with staff to ensure that there are appropriate setbacks that either meet or exceed the city's typical standards for this type of development. We have had an opportunity to review the city staff reports and we appeared before the Toronto Preservation Board. In principle, we do not object to the property being designated, although we do have some concerns with the scope of the heritage attributes identified in the staff report. During the review of the development applications, we have consulted and collaborated with city heritage staff to ensure that the proposed development is thoughtfully designed to conserve the cultural heritage of the site. Our support of the designation is predicated on the designation not adversely impacting the requested approval and that we work the work that we have undertaken with city staff. I'd like to thank you today for the opportunity to address the committee. Thank you. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thanks for joining us today. That concludes uh, the speakers on the item. Uh, any questions of staff? Dr. Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, through you to staff, uh, with respect to the, the, this, the recommendation, the report to designate, um, that uh, recommendation um, is, is coming to us after careful review and consideration from planning staff uh, to advance and move forward the designation. Is that not correct? Uh, through the chair, yes, that is. Okay, thank you. And uh, even if properties are designated, um, obviously applicants and owners can still submit an application to amend or perhaps change uh, some of those uh, uh, to, to some of the, the attributes of that building, and, and, and even in some cases, demolish, albeit rare. Is, is that correct? Um, that is correct. So, by designating the property, it doesn't necessarily uh, shrink wrap the property or or, or pro prohibit any future changes um, uh, if uh, if it's done in consultation and with a good planning rationale, uh, and of course uh, with uh, with the support of preservation services as well as city council. Um, would that be a correct uh, assertion? Uh, that's correct. It's it guides the conservation strategy. Okay. And then without the designation, um, what uh, what measures or tools would be in place to ensure that uh, that the building would be um, recognized for its heritage attributes or perhaps its cultural assets? Without the designation, what what uh, what what limitations are there or or none? I'm not available of any, I'm not aware of any uh, tool with the same authority as the Heritage Act. Um, sometimes things can be incorporated through the Planning Act, but that isn't uh, that certainly isn't something that has any authority in terms of heritage planning. Okay, thank you. And I guess um, there was some comment that perhaps this uh, that this site 95 um, uh, Saint Joseph should uh, perhaps. Um, be able to absorb some high rise density, perhaps treat it as a Bay Street, um, um, perhaps, you know, treat it with some Bay Street typology, which of course are very large towers, significant floor plates, oftentimes, you know, over a thousand square, uh, square, uh, square meters. Um, is that the right treatment for 95 uh, St. Joseph? Is that the right way for us to uh, approach this? Uh, through the chair, I, I wouldn't comment uh, from my scope. On the planning matters there, uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Lintern might advise. I do know that the boundary consideration is happening through the University of Toronto secondary plan. I'll just add uh, to the chair, uh, Councillor Wong Tan, that um, 
I think you raise an issue that will be canvassed through the review of the planning application and considered by East York, uh, Toronto East York community planning staff in uh, due course. Okay, thank you. So maybe I'll just reframe the uh, re reword the question a little bit. Are there any uh, portions of 95 St. Joseph that actually touch Bay Street? Is there a Bay Street elevation here? Uh, I don't know if we have community planning staff from uh, Toronto East York with us. I just don't want to miss, you know, misrepresent an answer to your valid questions, counselor. So I'm that's why I'm hesitating. Sorry. Okay, thank you. I mean, we are dealing with the designation here and not the the planning matter, which would be considered by community council. Okay, um, thank you. That's very helpful. I'll, I'll just end it there. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, any other members of the committee with questions? Seeing none, speakers on the item? Councillor Longtown. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, move the recommendations in the staff report as well as the, uh, the letter of endorsement coming from the Preservation Board. Um, this is a very important building uh, part of the, uh, the U of T campus as, uh, as one would call it, but also it's a part of a very important, um, uh, it's, a, it's an important asset within the, uh, the Bay Clover Hill community. Um, and, I, and I would just offer this, Madam Speaker, is that oftentimes we do have uh, assets uh, that are you know, physical in nature that are flagged by community members or perhaps even by our preservation staff that it re re requires a review. Um, and the staff have gone through its due diligence. They've determined that this is a, this is a significant property that it's warrants a part four designation of the Heritage Act, um, and that the applicant, um, you know, in this case it might be Daniel or the Basilian, uh, you know, brothers, that they can still submit an application, and it sounds like they, they have. But all of that should be done in consideration while the property is still designated. Um, and um, and it's it, it's not just the it's not just the physical building which I think is important, but it's also the history of what happens in these places that are important to not just the U of T community but also to the area neighborhood. So I just want to, would like to you know number one endorse have this committee perhaps vote uh, have a recorded vote on the endorsement of the staff report, um, but also recognize that you know change is happening in the downtown core. Oftentimes that change has to sit comfortably right next to and and. And, and budding uh, heritage uh, assets as well as cultural assets. Um, and there is a way for everyone to be able to work together and to do it sensi uh, uh, sensibly uh, as well as sensitively. Um, and, uh, and with that, I would encourage all partners to continue to dialogue. Um, we're, we know that change is going to take place, but we don't want to necessarily bring a, a wrecking ball to any of the city's very co important cultural assets. Not to mention the fact that once it's demolished or removed or, or permanently altered, is that we lose it altogether. And if we want to be known as a as a city with just you know gleaming glass towers, and very little else, um, then then we strive for that. But if we want to be a city that's known for heritage, for for culture, for arts, for the science, for you know innovation, then we have to find a way to let all of that coexist at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Council Wong Tam. So, Council Wong Tam moves the recommendations with the uh, request for a recorded vote. All those in favor? I, I don't think the Councillor is hearing me. In favor? I don't know if they asked me. Do you want me to ask, Nancy? I can do it. Okay, I'll do it. Councillor Wong Tam. In favor. Councilor Bradford. In favor. Councilor Perk. In favor. Councilor Nunziata. In favor. Councilor Fletcher. In favor. Councilor Bailao, in favor. That carries unanimously. Okay, so that concludes uh, our business for today. Thank you, members of the committee. And uh, it's an early day today for planning and housing. It's uh, 3, 340. <laughs> Uh, stay well. Thank you. Thanks, staff, for, for all your work. See you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody.